So good morning, everyone. So let's continue our conference and it's the next talk of uh, Alice. Yes. <clears throat> Yesterday is a perturbation serum. Today is a more general serum. So uh, recall our general strategies, the following. <clears throat> Suppose we have a sequence of compatification of our Einstein metric. So where I have a sequence of Einstein metric, GJ plus. And with this uh, GJ plus, I have associated, I don't know how to point this. Okay. Oh, then, then, then it's fine, it's fine. Then, then I don't need it. Then I don't need it. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that given this uh, sequence of a uh, Poincare Einstein metric, GJ plus, and then uh, I have a compatification, which I will specify later. And then uh, the GJ hat is the boundary metric. Okay, so we impose conditions that this boundary metric is compact. We want to see under what condition the interior metric is compact. Okay. And the main step uh, in the proof is uh, we sort of uh, given this uh, nice sequence of GJ, we, the main step is to prove its curvature is bounded or its curvature together with its first derivative is bounded. And, and to achieve this, we sort of using a blow up argument. Suppose it's not, we blow it up. We mean we rescale it. And then this is a bounded metric and which converges in the Gromov-Hoss sense to a metric. And then we have chosen the sequence of metric with some good property, rho j, and to ensure this rho j scaled metric also converges. So the limiting case, we have this metric and then a g infinity plus, and because it comes from Einstein metric, it's also Einstein. And then we try to say that our goal is to show this limiting case is g infinity plus is actually hyperbolic. We want to put condition. And then because the nice choice of this row, we turn back to say that this g infinity bar is flat. And then which is a contradiction because we normalize it at the point uh, rho j, a uh, pj, which is equal to one. And then we have some epsilon regularity property saying this pointwise convergence in this uh, C3 sense, mean in terms of this metric, actually again, so there's a C3 alpha. So the limiting metric also has at a point P infinity, this uh, P infinity is equal to one. So that's the contradiction. So that's the general scheme. And so now we want to see how does that happen? Okay. And yesterday in the perturbation theorem, we use this uh, sequence of compatified metric. Remember, I choose a very special sequence called Pfefferman Grand compatification. And that uh, is a totally geodesic. The boundary is totally geodesic. Second fundamental form is trivial on a boundary. And then for this uh, metric, uh, we reach perturbation theorem uh, under the assumption the vial L2 norm tend to zero. And if we want to push, remove this perturbation condition, we find out we not only need a epsilon regularity gain, we also want this limiting sequence have vanishing curvature at the infinity the limiting metric, a decay property of the curvature. And then our difficulty is we do not know for the Pfefferman Grand metric or for any, for that matter, for any totally geodesic 
compatibility, why the curvature is in L2. Okay, so in other words, we have the following situation. Of course, this uh, uh, gauss bonnet theorem is uh, uh, for manifold without boundary, but if this is uh, for manifold without boundary, but if it's totally geodesic, if the metric is totally geodesic, then there's no boundary term. So in order to say that this is finite, this curvature L2 known is finite, even adding the vial L2 is finite, I do not see why the curvature square is finite. Okay, I do not see. So this is a difficulty we have. So for that reason, today we change our strategy. We choose a different sequence of GJ plus, and I will explain what is what do we choose. You're assuming that this discussion is going on for a four manifold with with three dimensional boundary, right? Yes. Okay. So yeah, three dimensional boundary. Right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, for this reason, we change our strategy to choose this compatibility, and let me explain the thing we choose. And instead of choosing this adapted metric, which is uh, totally geodesic, we come back to choose the metric which is not totally geodesic. That is, we begin to deal with the boundary term. Okay, we pay a price. And so what is that metric we choose? The metric we choose correspond to this uh, S parameter equal to two. Okay, so yesterday our S parameter when N equal to three is four. And but we choose this, this or the, this uh, Poisson equation for S equal to two. So remember my S parameter is n over two plus gamma. And for the Pfefferman grand metric, this G star is gamma equal to three over two. But today we choose a flat representative for gamma equal to one half. Okay. So the PDE is satisfied by its uh, conformal factor satisfied minus G plus G plus is the Einstein rho two minus two rho two equal to zero. And this happened to be the conformal Laplacian of the G plus metric. As a result, this G two metric uh, has a other good property, but it's no longer totally geodesic. So here is the good property of this metric. First, we look at its asymptotic expansion. That means our boundary metric is given, H or G hat, <clears throat> and it's a geodesic defining function, which is R. This row two expansion <clears throat> is R minus R square, and then this and the local term. And in this case, this in the local term is the mean curvature. So we have a mean curvature expansion on this behavior. But it has other good property. The good property is first, its scalar curvature is equal to zero. So it's scalar flat. Okay. And that's because, as I say, the conformal Laplacian for the Poincare metric happened to be this number is scalar curvature equal to minus 12. So this is minus two. And by conformal change, you see this metric, which is defined to be rho square G plus has scalar curvature equal to zero. So it's scalar flat. And then the second observation is, <clears throat> we also have some information of its mean curvature. And that information is if the <clears throat> sorry, if the boundary is scalar curvature is positive, then the mean curvature is positive. Okay. 
And there are many different ways to see why this is true. Here is one way. Here is one way. So I, I'm sorry. So you said it was non-local, that term, right? In, in an expansion of row two. Yes. The term that will give you the R mean. Term. Yeah. The, okay. So the, the coefficient of that term. Yes, mean will, curvature. Will give you the mean curvature if you compactify with row two as a conformal factor. That's right. But you said it's non-local. So you've hit an initial root. Yes. So that's a non-local term. Doesn't come from the boundary, but we know it's mean curvature. Okay. It's a I, D D row D normal, something like that. Okay. So there is a boundary term. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So that boundary term has positive scalar uh, mean curvature. And there are various ways to see this. One way is to use conformal change because we already know, say, for example, the Pfefferman gram metric is totally geodesic. So its mean curvature is zero. And while they have the same boundary, and this Pfefferman gram metric is uh, mean curvature zero. So if you look at a conformal factor between G4 and G2, I call it U square. And we know that the boundary is the same. So U is equal to one on boundary. And then I use the conformal change from G4 to G2. So this conformal Laplace on U2 is zero. So that means this Conformal Laplace U on the boundary, U is equal to zero, while this uh, F U minus one is uh, negative, okay? Because uh, we know the scalar curvature of Pfefferman gram metric is positive. So that means U is less than one. So on the uh, boundary on X, okay, because the maximum principle. So U is less than one on boundary, uh, on interior is equal to one on the interior, means its outer normal derivative is positive. And from that, you use the rule of changing from G to G star, that is, uh, the, this is G2 to G4 star, you conclude the mean curvature of G2 is positive. So okay. Uh, yes, uh, because I'm sorry, there is a, uh, I should say this. Uh, so there are many different ways of seeing this is only one way. I have chosen my G2 such that the scalar curvature is zero. So this LG4 on U is zero. Okay, because the special relation between G4 and G2. And then I use this uh, conformal change. Yeah. Okay. Their boundary is the same, these two metrics, but on the other hand, I know their mean curvature satisfy this relationship. And then I know this du d normal has a sign positive. So that means this G2 star is positive. Okay, I use this as a bridge, okay, as a bridge. Okay, okay. Anyway, so I'm saying that the scalar curvature is positive on the boundary indicate for this special situation, the mean curvature is positive. I don't know its size, but I have a sign, okay? So, and now uh, there's another observation which we learned from Fen Wang. And we say that this uh, uh, gradient of this conformal factor, the derivative is gradient of rho is less than one on boundary. 
it's less than equal to one on the interior. And uh, I don't need to go through the proof, but uh, uh, for the Fetterman gram metric, this property comes from the scalar curvature is positive. Okay, but for this, one can also show that using the mean curvature is positive to see this has a growth control, gradient row less than one. So these are the three property I will use. Sorry, that's another question. Yeah, just the inequality you proved it. One minus gradient row square in inferior to one. Uh, isn't it something wrong? I'm saying that this gradient row on the boundary is equal to one and on the interior is less than equal to one. Yeah, but the inequality proof it's one minus something positive in inferior than one. So yeah. Okay, I consider something. And that D, because I have an asymptotic expansion of rho, this particular D on the boundary is mean curvature, which is positive. Yes. Anyway, anyway, so my conclusion is this, how about believe me? Okay, maybe there's a typo. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I mean, it's hard for me to think about the sign. The, okay, sure. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, this is not, this is less than one. It's, this is positive, sure. Yes, I'm sorry. So this means. How about that? Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry, on X, okay. Okay, and now uh, we now need to deal with the manifold with boundary. And let's see what's the information. So for the gauss bonnet theorem, we have uh, that for manifold without boundary. With boundary, there is a messy boundary term, boundary term. But uh, there is a structure of this term. But in this particular case, we can see that if the interior, met the metric we choose has scalar curvature equal to zero, for our curvature, the boundary term is, there are three, two term. One is, uh, it's already embedded. So the boundary term is R hat, that is scalar on the boundary times H and minus two over 27 H cube. That's the gauss bonnet formula for this metric. And the important thing is this H cube, the coefficient is negative while we know H is positive. Okay, so as a consequence, we now get the curvature L2 known bound, assuming the vial curvature L2 known is bound. So this theorem tells us this, trace, this E is traceless Ricci because scalar is zero. Traceless Ricci square plus this mean curvature three, third power is bounded by this gauss bonnet term, and then this Euler characteristic term, and then information of R hat, and R hat is positive. So this R hat H is squeezed by the R hat L3 over two known and H L3 known. So you move over, you know this information that this curvature in L2 and mean curvature is in L3. Okay, so this is a good property of this. We use that fact. So this curvature, okay. So now I state a uh, reason work. Uh, uh, this is joint work with Yu Xingge. So the statement of the theorem is, we start with a four manifold and for other reason, we need to assume this uh, boundary is S3. And now we have a sequence of uh, CC manifold. And then I choose the representative GI to be my scalar flat adapted metric, the metric which I used before. Okay. And then my assumption is the boundary metric of this sequence, I assume is compact, okay, in some suitable norm. 
And then I assume that the boundary Yamabe constraint is bounded away from zero. Okay, so that's the assumption. And then I pose a second assumption. The second assumption is I assume for this, remember this is an invariant quantity, the L2 non vial. So for GI plus and for GI is the same. So since GI plus is given, so I assume it's L2 non is bounded. And then I pose a topological condition also for some technical reason, this H2 is zero. And then the conclusion is this sequence is compact. You see, I reach what I want. Okay. So uh, that's the main theorem. So let me now uh, outline the proof. And as this procedure is almost the same as uh, uh, the perturbation theorem, except uh, we, we, we only have vial in L2 instead of vial tends to zero. Okay, so first we derive epsilon regularity. And yesterday we derived the epsilon regularity using Bach equation. And now we need to derive this property using Bach equation, but we need to take care of the boundary term. Okay, so the iteration need to carry the boundary term. And, but it turns out we need a second thing. We derive some interior epsilon regularity. So we gain the regularity of the metric, but we also prove that the decay of the Ricci curvature for the blow up limit. Remember, we have a contradiction. We assume that the curvature is not bounded or blow up. And we, uh, this uh, blow up limit, this rescale limit, we want to say that this has curvature at the infinity dies down. Okay, that's the crucial step. And then we derive you no know, boundary blow up. Okay, and uh, in the you know, boundary blow up, there is a key step, which is the following. And since we assume this uh, uh, GI on the boundary is compact, remember we know that this rescaled one, this GI hat on boundary tends to uh, the R3 metric. So this uh, limiting metric has uh, this uh, boundaries R3. So we have in our model R3 dx square here. We interior is x4, x infinity. We don't know what that is, but uh, we try to say the universal cover of that is R4 plus. So here is the crucial step. The step is we say if the conformal infinity is dx square, and then the metric on that induce of this limiting metric on R3 dx square is actually the S3 metric, the canonical one. Okay. And uh, we do uh, to uh, identify it uh, as uh, S3. Okay. So, and this is done by identify some ex the conformal factor as the extremal metric for the Sobolov embedding. Okay, so I will explain this later. And then uh, uh, this step use the strategy of the proof of Dutta Jahafari and LQS inequality. So I will say a little bit later. And then we finish the program by saying there's no interior blow up. And then there is the topological argument and uh, we, we use result of neighbor chigger, neighbor chigger and uh, uh, we impose topological condition so that we can apply some uh, classification theorem of the limiting metric, the ALEM. Okay, so uh, if I have time, I will go over that. So uh, let me, uh, this is the outline. I give a little bit more detail, okay. So uh, first, epsilon regularity. And as I have mentioned yesterday, this is a build on this uh, Einstein metric is buff flat. So conformal to Einstein metric is also buff flat. So that means this Shelton tensor of this metric satisfies this elliptic PDE condition. Okay, 
So we need to carry out this elliptic PDE with boundary because our boundary is no longer totally geodesic. So in, that means when we integrate, say, Laplace AIJ, we multiply in by AIJ, we integrate, we try to get energy bound, we need to handle the boundary term. Okay, so this alpha, beta, gamma are tangential component. And we say we can express this in terms of the information coming from the boundary Shelton tensor. Okay, so uh, then you use a, a formula like that. It's a bit of technical work, but uh, one need to do it carefully. And uh, we use a Bianchi identity, and we also use a gauss kaldasi equation. So there's the scalar curvature on the boundary is uh, uh, the same as a scalar curvature inside and plus the VC. So there's uh, this uh, term uh, on the boundary. Okay, there's uh, this curve and then there is second fundamental form square minus H square. Okay, so we do a messy computation and we see that this Normal derivative AIJ turn inner product with AIJ, the expansion, okay? And it turns out the important thing in the expansion is again, some sign of the coefficient and there's H fifth power and the H gradient H squared is means boundary and then H Laplace in H turn. And then there's other term, this A hat S alpha beta, this S is uh, the G3, G, uh, normal derivative of A alpha beta mu, okay, term, and so on, okay. So there are messy terms, a lot of terms. And one observation is for the blow up limit. So that means eventually we consider this GJ and its dilated sequence, this second line term vanishes. So only the first line term survive. Okay, so that's the, this term, this term vanishes on the rescale term in the limit case. So eventually the epsilon regularity theorem we get is on the interior estimate, we still have results like before you begin to, from curvature in L2, you get some estimate of its derivative. And this S term is the first derivative of the curvature. So if we start with some assumption, which is C3, we have control of that term. So that's why we, in this theorem, we require a little bit more CK alpha for K bigger than equal to five. And then the important thing is to notice that under this curvature in L2 condition, this limiting metric has VC decay of some positive number delta. So as uh, X tends to infinity, this is happening on, uh, you, you, you open it up. So this is on X infinity, on X infinity. So it's a non-compact situation. So at the infinity, it has decay, okay. So uh, uh, the proof of this uh, for the limiting case is uh, to use this uh, formula of this lemma and then you integrate. You notice that this uh, uh, A gradient mu A is uh, greater than, say let me counting on the limiting case, the other term all vanishes and then uh, this uh, positive coefficient of H5 and the other term squeeze out to say since is bounded from below by H cube. And from there, you get epsilon regularity. I skip a lot of uh, technical detail. And okay, and now let's see that why there is decay at the infinity for the limiting metric. So the picture is the following. Now we have this curvature is in L2, H cube is bounded. L3 norm of H is bounded. So that means if you take a ball large outside the ball, the energy turn is small. 
okay, the energy turn. The total thing is finite. You take a compact, big compact ball, outside that is small. And then that tells you the curvature decay because that uh, you have the following picture. Say you have a fixed point, a ball A, and then for points outside to our ball, the X R ball is completely located in the region of A complement, ball A complement. Okay, this ball is containing this A complement. And then uh, you use your iteration scheme to see that uh, this is less than R to the fourth power by this uh, epsilon regularity property for that ball outside this. And for that reason, you get curvature decay. Okay, so I have used the property, the things globally in L2 and the boundaries in H3. Okay, so I put a little bit of remark to say, if you assume G is in C5, we get X squared. If we if this is in C3, then we get X delta for some delta, which is one half. I only need a positive delta. So there is a certain room for improvement of regularity there. Okay, so that gives me the technical uh, thing to have epsilon regularity and uh, uh, the decay. And now uh, I'll begin to show that this sequence has no boundary blow up. Okay. So that means, remember that means I have this sequence, rho j, the, the maximum of point happen at the point pj, so this rm gj plus maybe gradient rm gj at the point pj is equal to one and uh, uh, is, uh, the limit is equal to one and uh, its supernum is less than one. So, and then the, uh, I assume interior blow up in interior, I'm sorry, I, I deal with boundary blow up. Means my sequence of GJ, PJ to the distance stay bounded. So the limit of this point PJ has a potential to reach the boundary. Okay, so it happens in a street. So in that case, um, what we really did is we say that there is a uniqueness theorem, a alluvial type of theorem for hyperbolic metric. So the real theorem we get is the following. Let me restate. And that is, uh, suppose I look at a blow up limit, then that is blow up limit has scalar equal to zero and it's bounded curvature. And important thing is its distance function is bounded by one. That's the property of this particular uh, sequence. And then one can actually use this to show the interior and the boundary injectivity radius of the sequence is bounded above and bounded from below. Okay, injectivity radius is bounded from below. And I also know that the conformal infinity is R3. Okay. And then additional information I have is there is curvature decay. That is uh, on the, uh, uh, at the X tends to infinity, uh, this uh, distance is one over distance to the delta power. Okay. Then my conclusion is this sequence, this metric is hyperbolic metric and the compatification of that is the Euclidean metric. Okay, so that's for hyperbolic metric, that's the uniqueness theorem. Okay, this uniqueness theorem says there's no boundary blow up. Okay, okay. so, and the main chunk of the proof is actually to prove this theorem. Okay, so that's the key part of the proof. And so let me uh, say uh, a bit about the idea of the proof, how to use this condition. Okay, so for that, 
we borrow the idea of the proof of a Duta Jaha, Ravi, okay, and LQS. So what is their inequality? Their inequality says in our setting, they have a more general setting, but in particular for CC manifold, there is this uh, quotient of the volume of the ball, and this part is greater than or equal to the volume on the boundary, that's bishop Gromov theorem, and it's monotonically increasing in T. And then the proof provide a lower bound. They say in this setting, it's greater than the Yamabe constant on the boundary divided by Yamabe constant on the sphere. Okay, so yesterday uh, I put this uh, boundary X at the S as SD minus one, it's not necessary. Their theorem holds for any X. Okay, so that's their theorem. Okay, and then the key part of their proof is to derive the lower bound. And in our case, we want to, in our limiting case, we want to push this constant. This is always less than or equal to one. Uh, we want to push this to become an upper bound in the limit case. So they have a lower bound estimate. We have an upper bound estimate. And then the other difference of our proof is they deal with a compact boundary. They have a X, which is a conformally Einstein compact. So they deal with a bounded uh, boundary. Boundary is compact. We deal with uh, this R3. So the, the proof is, uh, so we need this curvature decay to help us to deal with the boundary. Okay. So, uh, so that's uh, the comparison between these two theorems. Okay. So uh, now be, let me uh, set up uh, this thing. So the main idea is the following. We fix a point on the interior. And then we consider this a ball, hyperbolic ball. Okay. And so there is this hyperbolic ball whose boundary I denote by gamma t. Okay, so this is gamma t. Then, uh, there is a, we introduce a second comparison. So you have this uh, ball, which is the hyperbolic ball, which is the hyperbolic ball. which is the hyperbolic ball. Mm, sorry, let me uh, say the hyperbolic ball is very large. So I have this hyperbolic ball, which continue, okay. Hyperbolic ball. And then this T, G plus metric. Okay, X. And then we also have our metric G, which we know is a thing. So it is a compact thing. So we begin to consider another distance function, which is the distance function of our row square G plus. So that's our metric G. Okay. So this introduce a second distance function depending on our conformal factor. The idea is to compare the level curve of the metric induced by G bar to the hyperbolic metric. Okay, so we begin to think about that uh, we have this uh, uh, G bar, which is equal to rho square G plus. Okay, and then we have this level curve. I use the parameter tau. It turns out the right comparison is I think about rho as e to the minus two tau. Uh, there is a four for technical reason G plus. And then I look at the level curve of tau, where tau is equal to log rho over two. 
okay. And here I'm using my G bar metric. Here I use G plus metric. I use this uh, uh, G bar metric. I begin to compare these two curves. Okay. And why is this a natural com comparison? Because in the standard model case, tau and T are the same. Okay. So in a standard model case, recall that in the model case of B4S3, I have my hyperbolic metric. And then in that case, uh, my G2 is actually the flat metric. So in that case, my rho is just one minus X squared over two. And my tau is log of one minus X squared over four. But if I choose my point to be the center of the ball, then the hyperbolic distance function is log of one minus X or one plus X. So these two distance function are comparable. Okay, comparable. So I am uh, comparing this level set to this level set. Okay, so this level set. And now for that reason, I consider the conformal factor between this compatified metric to that hyperbolic G theta metric. Okay, so, and this, uh, this psi is tau minus t, one half, and I call the function u, the difference between tau and t. So I'm going to estimate that factor, okay? Okay, so what's the basic strategy? The basic strategy is I want to uh, begin to say that if I consider this uh, key estimate is, I estimate the energy of this function psi conformal factor on a boundary and then compare it with psi to the sixth power to the one half power. So this is the, this index is the index of isometric of this Sobolov embedding. So one fact one has is notice that on R3, for any function in H1, uh, we have Sobolov embedding and that power is six to the one third less than gradient V square. And the constant, the sharp constant is this particular constant. So this quotient has a lower bound. Okay, so this energy has a lower bound. So, and so the strategy is I'm going to push this quotient to an upper bound the same at its lower bound, okay? And then so if, if this quotient as A tends to infinity is the same as this, that means this psi is the critical extremum function of this isometric embedding. And we know all the extremum function of this uh, Sobolov embedding and uh, that's, S3, that's the metric on S3. So you identify this metric, although living on R3 is actually the same as S3. Okay. So that's the key estimate. And once we reach that, say psi restrict to R3 is the extremum function for the Sobolov embedding, then uh, one has this following argument we know that the psi six uh, on this uh, curve gamma, this uh, gamma tau is actually the length of this uh, gamma tau. And then we compare the length of this gamma tau with the length of this boundary of T, omega T to GT tau, okay, GT. We compare these two. And then, uh, so there's a step which says the length of that is compared to the length of the coming from the uh, hyperbolic distance. And then uh, we notice one following fact 
that is the length of the hyperbolic distance twice this, the quotient of that is a, a explicit formula because G plus is Einstein and as T go to infinity is the same as equal to the length of gamma t g t theta divided by the standard hyperbolic distance and the standard hyperbolic distance, the length of the curve tends to this omega d minus one or d is equal to four, so it's S3. So the quotient of that then tends to one. And so that means our metric is the hyperbolic metric by the volume comparison. Okay, so uh, that's the outline. So now let me uh, say a bit about how do you show this key estimate, this uh, gradient psi square tends to less than equal to S3 as this A tends to infinity. This P has the projection of P to the bump. Okay, so maybe, Maybe I take three minutes break and then come back to show how to do that. Okay. Thank you, Alice. Maybe there are some urgent questions right now for her. So, uh, sorry. So I will begin to prove this key estimate of how to estimate this quotient. Okay. Uh, the first observation is tau and the t uh, in a hyperbolic case, standard hyperbolic t is uh, uh, when x is near the conformal infinity, they are the same. Okay, so we expect tau minus t to have good control. So these two parameter tau minus t. One is the distance function, the other is this uh, conformal factor log rho over two. And first, uh, one can show that uh, in the non-compact case, u is not bounded, okay? at infinity it's not bounded, but gradient u is bounded. And then when you call close to uh, this uh, x tau, x tau means this region, the asymptotic tubular neighborhood, they are bounded, okay? So this uh, distance function in G and this uh, tau is bounded. So U is bounded on the asymptotic neighborhood and gradient U is bounded. That shows this psi, which is equal to exponential minus U never vanishes, okay? So that's a technical point. And then, the second step is we claim two estimate. Okay. Uh, so we want to uh, estimate this quotient. So what we do is we upper estimate the energy and lower estimate this volume. Okay. So uh, for the energy estimate, we have this gradient psi is, that's the key step is related to the scalar curvature on this tau, okay, with respect to G tau metric and D volume plus O1. And why is that so? And that's because first, this G theta is psi force G bar. So there is, uh, we use this repeatedly, this uh, uh, equation the scalar curvature G tau is related to Laplace inside. Okay. And uh, for our metric G bar, the scalar curvature is equal to zero. So that term is not there. So the energy is the same as the scalar. Okay. So, and then you multiply this volume form is psi to the sixth power. So that means you multiply this PDE on side on both sides and estimate. So when you estimate gradient side with side, uh, you have, uh, now we are on boundary. So there is this boundary term. So the key estimate is the following. 
First, we say that on this ball, which is very large, then on the boundary of the ball, so we have this ball now, ball of radius A. And on the boundary of the ball intersect this thing. We want to say psi has an estimate. Psi is less than one over A and then log A. Okay, so this one can show that uh, this uh, delicate estimate is true. And then we use the fact Rizzi has decay to show D psi D normal has a decay. Okay, that's the crucial step. So if your curvature is vanishing at infinity, then this function psi, which is the conformal factor has a decay. Okay. Assuming these two estimate, then when you estimate the energy, you can handle the boundary term comes from estimated energy. And that is, if you count order, this psi is of order one over a modular log a. D psi d a is a one plus this a little bit delta power, but this boundary of ball intersection is hypersurface is two dimensional. This ball intersects that. So we are integrating over there, which is two dimensional space. So this is of order sort of like a square. So you have some leftover. So this term tend to zero. So your boundary integration go to zero. So that means when you estimate the energy, you get gradient size square, basically bounded by the curvature. That's estimate A, upper bound. So here we use the decay of the curvature. And then uh, we, we estimate the uh, uh, size six, the volume bound. And uh, th that's uh, just uh, size six dx is just the length of this uh, hypersurface. And we estimate that as tau go to infinity, yeah, a go to infinity is big O one, little O one, sorry. Okay. So that's uh, the two uh, step, upper and lower estimate. And then what do we do is we begin to estimate this scalar curvature G tau. Okay, so this energy is upper estimate by scalar curvature of G tau. And that is, uh, uh, there's a lot of technical work, but on the other hand is basically this RG tau or the uh, asymptotically tends to six. And so now this uh, value is basically six times the length of that curve. Okay. Okay. So here, this estimate is a relatively easy if we assume there is no cut locus point. So here we take the hyperbolic ball. So sometimes you worry that the hyperbolic ball geodesic distance hit points, which has a cut locus. So you need to handle it separately. That's quite technical. I don't think, uh, anyway. So without a locus point, assume since it's locally C2 in that neighborhood, then you, you can get this estimate. So that's step three. And then the step four is we begin to estimate this lens on G tau metric vice this uh, uh, GT metric, okay? Uh, on, yeah, this lens, this lens, why is that lens, okay, why is that lens? And we say that uh, uh, it is, has an uh, upper bound, okay? So um, all these steps uh, can be carried out, assume there is no cut locus point. And then combine this step two, three, and the four, we get this estimate that you have scalar curvature and then the volume bound, the upper bound of psi is the scalar curvature 
This one is constant because uh, this uh, conformal Laplace in three dimension, the scalar curvature has one ace in front of it. Okay, so uh, that's one ace and then the scalar curvature and divide the lower bound of that is the length of this surface, the, the boundary surface. Uh, then, uh, yeah, I, I don't need to. So you use your previous estimate to say that's S3. So you get the upper bound you want. And so I'm sorry that, uh, yeah, if uh, one look at uh, combining this step carefully, you do get an upper bound, okay. So uh, you, uh, the conclusion now is we know this ball in this setting has the same growth as hyperbolic ball, so the Bishop comparison theorem tell you it's the hyperbolic space. So the conclusion is it's the hyperbolic space. Okay. And now, uh, so that's the technical part of uh, most technical part of the proof. Okay. Uh, to upper lower estimate this thing and to say that psi is actually the metric on S3. Okay. Identify this boundary metric as S3 metric. And from there, you get this uh, hyperbolic metric, okay? And then uh, as in the case of uh, uh, G4 yesterday, we still need to cross the hyperbolic metric to say the metric G infinity bar is actually the flat metric. Here is actually bar metric. And that you use a, you use a, a Liouville theorem, okay? So you derive another Liouville theorem. It turns out in this case, the Liouville theorem is actually easier than in the Pfefferman grand case because you only deal with a second order PDE. Somehow in the Pfefferman grand metric to derive the Liouville theorem, we use its Q4 flat. It's a fourth order thing. Here it's only a second order thing. Since I have time, I will cover a little bit about that. So, uh, so uh, you pass to universal cover. So what do you have? is there is uh, this solution on upper half space, which is our G2 solution, with the property its gradient is less than or equal to one. Okay. And then its boundary is Y plus OY square on this asymptotic neighborhood. And we claim there's only one such solution and that's rho equal to Y. Okay, so that's the new view thing. And the proof is uh, uh, relatively easy. In this case, we begin to consider uh, V, which is rho over Y, and then consider this conformal factor to squeeze that conformal factor V to become one. We know V on the boundary is equal to one. And also this metric, G, I'm sorry, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, GR4 is a scalar flat, okay, GR4 is scalar flat. R4 is scalar flat, that's what I call genome metric. The background metric is flat, so this Laplace V is equal to zero, and then uh, you use this Gradient row less than or equal to one, it becomes this solution. And I'm sorry, it's easy if you uh, sit down and see that's true. So and we get rho is less than or equal to y. So that means we have a harmonic function on the upper half space where v minus one is a bounded harmonic function because it's less than or equal to one. And then uh, we do an odd extension to say it's bounded 
harmonic con R4 and concludes equal to one. Okay, so this uh, procedure is quite a uh, standard. Uh, yeah, sorry. So maybe I shouldn't cover it here. But anyway, there is a real theorem to conclude rho equal to y. Okay. So the, let me say that why real view theorem is necessary here. Remember that when we uh, construct this adapted metric, we do it on compact manifold or the conformally compact Einstein manifold. So there, uh, the solution is unique. You know it's unique. But now we blow it up, we are on this uncompact domain R4 plus. So at that time, it's not clear that uh, this uh, flat home theory apply to this non-compact setting. So there is a little bit of additional work to do. Okay, so each time at the end, you need to show that uh, some type of real view theorem apply to this setting. Okay, so uh, with this, this uniqueness theorem tells me there is no boundary blow up. Okay, so this uniqueness theorem is a strategy to prove no boundary blow up. Now, uh, let me say, uh, why there is no interior blow up? Okay, and this was actually done in an early paper. My first paper with Yu Xingge, and the argument is already there. Okay, so what is the interior blow up? Interior blow up means it's not a boundary blow up. So this point P i goes to infinity. So this blow up point distance of P i to G i bar goes to infinity. Okay. And then we have this uh, uh, function, which is the blow up limit, which is scalar flat. Okay. And uh, first one needs to, we already know this uh, G j, each is scalar flat. So this limiting metric is scalar flat. So the main claim, the, the claim is in this case, we actually have Ricci flat. Okay. So in the case of Pfeffermann gram metric, because it's Q flat and the scalar flat, it's Ricci flat. But here we only have this G2 metric. So there's a little bit of additional argument to say what that is happening. But in this case, uh, we also have this, uh, uh, Remember this uh, distance now go to infinity. So that means this rho i bar at this point p i, my rho and p look the same, but uh, it's uh, uh, this actually go to infinity. And while we also have this bounded estimate, gradient less than or equal to one, so that imp imply if we look at the relation between uh, Scalar curvature. Okay, so here there is a little bit of. Uh, oh, we know that uh, using this PDE, we know Laplace in row is this quantity. Okay, direct computation. And this gradient plus rho over rho square is the same as gradient rho in this G matrix is less than one. So Laplace, so if your rho at some point go to infinity, Laplace in G rho is going to be bounded. And then uh, we see that uh, this hashing of rho, we remember this Ricci curvature have this transformation rule. This is uh, basically hashing rho and plus this G inverse Laplace G. And then there is a rho there, G there. So uh, let's G there and plus uh, the background metric and the background metric has a, sorry. So when I apply this, we actually apply this uh, to G. And yeah, so the, 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 this equality is true because rho square G is Einstein. Okay, so otherwise there is this G plus. Ricci comes in. So anyway, Laplace in row is bounded means Hessian row is bounded, and while this row is going to infinity, 
and you can show this rhesus goes to zero, okay, goes to zero, okay. So we have a, a rhesus flat metric in the limiting case. And then we notice that we also have this non-collapsing case for this metric. And this uses the fact that we already know the Yamabe constant is bounded from below. And then we also in the limiting metric, which has curvature bound, curvature bound plus Yamabe bound, Yamabe constant bound means it's non-collapsing. Okay. And so under these two conditions, we begin to apply a result of Chigger and neighbor. Okay. And this result is a corollary of their co-dimension four theorem. And uh, what is it basically says is in this case, if you have the volume, uh, a Ricci flat case and non-collapsing of the volume, then you automatically has curvature in L2 bound. Okay, curvature in L2 bound. So in particular, this, uh, so in particular, while L2 known is bound. Notice we assume while is in L2 bound, but it's not used here. We only use while in L2 bound to handle boundary blow up. In the interior case, this is a consequence of neighbor and the trigger. And so while is uh, on B1 is bounded, but it's really flat. So that means uh, you can, this quantity is scale invariant. So once it's hold for one ball, you rescale it and it still apply the same theorem. Eventually you exhaust this space. So the vial is in L2 bound, okay? And then uh, in this case, uh, you use some compactness theorem. In this case, you have curvature in L2 bound. You know that uh, there is a, uh, space, you know what type of orbifold singularity it is. It is a A or E end of all the three, but that's not important. The important thing is we know it's conformal infinity. The metric is S3 quotient gamma for some subgroup of SO4. I myself am not too familiar with this part. It's done by Yu Xingge, as you can see. Okay, and then, uh, so here, we really do not use the boundary of X is S3, but here comes a point we use the boundary is S3. So what we did is uh, in our early version of the paper, we quote a result of Anderson to say there is no interior bound, but it turns out that, that argument has a gap. So uh, we need to add a S3 condition. So the way we add S3 is uh, we uh, connect X infinity, attach it to a four ball and glue it along S3. And you use your assumption H2 of XZ is equal to zero to show that this space is a homological four sphere. Its homology is all the four sphere. And then we begin to code some early, very early work of a uh, quiz human, okay? Which says, if you have a close oriented homological four sphere, and if you have this S3 over gamma embedded in X theta, then you know what's the group gamma. It's either one or Q8, this is quaternion group, okay? So what we did now is you, you compute to say, gamma can only be one, uh, Q8 is excluded out, or is uh, the, the perfect group. So anyway, and you exclude this out by doing the explicit computation using the signature formula and uh, uh, to show, and the Gauss-Bonnet formula to show that's not possible. When gamma equal to one, these two formula tells you the vial is equal to zero, and that's what we want, the limiting case. Or for Q8, we also know what's the eta invariant. They're all computed in the literature, and under vial L2 non-bound, you know that's not possible. That's basically the proof. 
So, uh, so that means that uh, gamma can only be equal to one, and which says that uh, the limiting case is while flat. So, uh, or in other words, there is no interior blow, uh, no interior blow up, which completes the proof of the main compactness. Okay, so that's our argument. Uh, this uh, last step, as I say, is the only place we use the boundary is S3 and also the topological condition H2 is zero. Okay. okay. Any question? <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, uh, given uh, what I have talked here, uh, there are some obvious open questions. Okay. So uh, the first question is, notice uh, in my uh, perturbation result and in early work, I use one type of choice of representative Feynman gram metric in my case. And in this last part, I use G2 metric. And the only reason is I do not know this RISI of this uh, adapted metric GS curvature L2 is bound. I do not know. Okay. So the open question is, under the vial L2 known condition, L, vial in L2 condition, does this already happen? Okay. So I think in general, it's hard to show its curvature is in L2, but under the vial L2 condition, I know for G2, this has L2 known bound. Okay. Notice as a consequence of our compactness theorem, this is true. Because we know that once the compactness theorem holds for one S, and there is a range of S, it holds for another S. So if I can establish the compactness theorem for G2, I already know it holds for G4 as a consequence, but I couldn't see, we couldn't see it directly, okay? If we can see this directly, then we don't need to deal with G2 metric, the boundary case, right? the boundary terms. Okay? So this is, uh, we struggle with that thing for a long time. Okay, we try to show that uh, uh, for this uh, Pfefferman grand metric, under the vial L2 known bound, the curvature is already in L2. We couldn't quite do it. And then, of course, the obvious question is, I have two assumptions. One is the boundary metric has Yamabe constant bounded from below. And then the condition, the other condition, the interior vial L2 known is bounded. Are these two conditions related? Does one imply the other? Okay. And uh, when this delta is very close to the Yamabe constant of S3 in a standard case, we know they are equivalent. Okay. And then also the neighbor Chigger theorem tells us sometimes this second condition A2 happens for Ricci flat metric okay, in the interior blow up argument, in, in the interior blow up. So that makes me wonder if there is a other way of seeing this. We believe this is a difficult question, but we don't know. Okay. And so uh, in the case of, there is some possibility in the case of B4S3, it's easier than other cases, but uh, we, we, we are not sure. Okay. But uh, this is definitely, the, the whole philosophy is in the CCE case, the boundary situation, if you are conformally compact, control the interior growth. So that's something, if A1 imply A2, that's something in this direction, but uh, we do not know, we do not know, okay. Okay, and then the other condition, another thing which we also are working on is, under what condition such that uh, on the boundary, at this moment we only add the boundary Yamabe constant is bounded from below. Suppose on the boundary, we add more condition, okay? More constraint. 
would that imply while is in L2? While is in L2, okay. And this is related uh, to the concept of renormalized volume, okay. The renormalized volume is a term which is basically this uh, scalar curvature minus three Ricci square term. This fact was actually mentioned in a talk yesterday by someone that is uh, on four manifold, uh, you have this a pi square chi equal to y square and plus this term, uh, one six r square minus three Ricci square term. If boundary x is close. So this is a topological quantity. That's a conformal invariant quantity. So this is a conformal invariant quantity. Okay. And that conformal invariant quantity usually is called, one can show it's something called renormalized volume if boundary x g is totally geodesic. So uh, in particular, if we have other information, V plus is bounded from below, then this theorem, Boswell net theorem tells you vial is already bounded. Okay. So to squeeze the vial bound is to control this other uh, conformal invariant quantity, these are equivalent problems. So it means the integration of Q is either positive or has a lower bound. If in that case, then you do have the vial in L2. This is a problem in some sense I've discussed with Matt and with a number of other people over the years. We do not exactly see how to do that. Adding more boundary constraint do you have a control of that term? Okay, sure. So uh, with this, I conclude my talk. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Alice. Are there questions? So I, I was wondering about um, the role played in uh, this argument by the assumption that the Yamabe constant is uh, of the boundary is close to the sphere. Yes. So there's a, a nice gap theorem of, uh, of Bray and Nefsch on, on the Yamabe constants of three manifolds. If you have a, a three manifold who's, and a conformal class on it where the, uh, where the, uh, uh, where the Yamabe constant is, close to that of the three sphere, then topologically, it must be the three sphere, right? So they actually get a gap, the, the next, so it's, this has to do with the sigma constants of three manifolds, yes. and there's a gap. Where, R plus where I would, three. Awesome. Right, yes, that's yeah. right. So yeah. I was wondering if there might be some other way of controlling the, the fundamental group in, in, in your argument that would involve instead an assumption about uh, the yeah. Yamabe constant yeah. being close to the... You are completely right. The next step is to show you have this Yamabe constant, and next thing is RP3, which is a multiple of the Yamabe constant. Yeah. So between that, does this argument already hold? Yes, so that, that, would, be, that would be an effective, step. kind of an effective range, rather than that's just right. saying that's, that's the sum exactly, epsilon. Exactly, <laughs> that is true, that is true. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in, the, this adaptive metric, this uh, row two, was that yes. your notation row two? So are you getting lucky because in four dimensions, uh, the boundary is three dimensional and you don't see a log term? If you try to run the same argument and get a construct a scalar flat metric in the interior using that value of gamma, you should see a log, do you see a log? You must see a log term then. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, it so depends tried... on the dimension. Okay. And in this case, n equal to three, 
R dimension. When it's even dimension, you expect you hit R local. Okay, so then you would have it would be a problem trying to use a metric like this to do yeah your yeah. compactification. Uh, haven't, we haven't thought about that, but the one aspect problems. Okay. okay. Yes. All right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. Yes. Are there further questions? Yes. Um, is there any example of uh, blow ups uh, if you remove the assumptions on, on H2? So, because you might have a blow up profile. Uh, I'm sorry. If I didn't you remove get you. the assumption uh, on uh, H2, yes, uh, then you might have a blow up profile in the, blow in the interior in your blow up analysis, right? Uh, if uh, H2 is, uh, you're assuming H2, you're making a topological assumption, right? Yeah. So if that is non-zero, then uh, in the interior, in principle, there might be a blow up, right? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering whether there is any example of that. Okay. So can you construct so, uh, actually blow ups? Uh, early time, uh, set S1 lambda from the screen. That case, I can do that is uh, the interior is uh, uh, S2, uh, D2 cross the hyperbolic space. And in that case, one can see this H2 is not zero. So there are other things happening. Yes, it can happen. Can happen, can happen. Yeah, we haven't handled that. That's why we add this condition, yes. So, this program has a chance to work if we already know the interior topology is simple. And other case, we need other technique to handle it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's also true in the example of a hacking and page, when lambda is very small, the vial L2 known. There are two solutions. One of them, the vial L2 known is bound, the other term, the vial L2 non go to infinity. So, so this condition does come in. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Thanks. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. The other condition is something like uh, if your uh, interior metric G plus has sectional curvature less than or equal to zero, then in that case, there is a result of V and so on saying in a neighborhood, you can have existence of other conformally filling in, but you need a sectional, you need some kind of a theorem to avoid the kernel of the Einstein solution. So you, you add some condition. <laughs> then that condition, again, if you look at the Hawking page example, does not satisfy. So, so, so there, there are other things going on. We are handling the simple case. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Are there further questions? So if not, let's thank Alice for all her lectures. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Um, so our next lecturer is uh, Claude Rebon from Stony Brook University, and he will uh, give a couple of lectures about the geometry of four manifolds, curvature, and balance. Okay, so this is the first of three lectures, and um, I'm going to start at a, a rather moderate level, uh, and uh, in a certain way, it would have probably worked better if I had given these lectures before Alice had started, because she assumed a lot of knowledge of uh, four-dimensional geometry. Um, <clears throat> so I'm hoping this will allow uh, some of the people in the audience to catch up and, uh, and understand some of the basic ideas in, in the field. I'll be talking today uh, about results that are a few years old. Uh, uh, the, the other two lectures will uh, talk about things that are more recent results. So uh, let me just remind you that we say that a, a Riemannian metric um, is uh, Einstein if it has a uh, constant Ricci curvature. And um, there are a couple of ironies about this. Uh, actually, this equation, the Ricci curvature is, a, is lambda times the metric, uh, was called by Einstein the greatest uh, blunder of his life. Here he is uh, wishing that he had never uh, considered the possibility that the metric wasn't Ricci flat. Um, 
So as punishment mathematicians call this uh, number lambda the Einstein constant. And uh, it has the same sign as the scalar curvature, which of course uh, <coughs> measures whether a, a, a small ball has larger or smaller a volume than it would in Euclidean space. So uh, one important uh, uh, approach towards uh, the uh, uh, trying understanding Einstein metrics is, is the following uh, variational problem. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about first is not uh, the, the one that you're probably most familiar with. Um, if you have a smooth compact in manifold where uh, N is greater than or equal to three, uh, and uh, if we look at the functional in the space of smooth metrics, uh, that's given by uh, the, the, the following uh, scale invariant functional, uh, its critical points are the Einstein metric. So if you take the uh, N over two norm of the scalar curvature, and I'll then raise it to the N over two power. So the integral of the, uh, of the absolute value of the scalar curvature to the power N over two has the property that uh, Einstein metrics are critical points. Um, <laughs> by the way, you might be worried about the fractional power. This is actually differentiable because we're assuming that uh, n is at least three. Um, <clears throat> it's not uh, quite true that the only critical points are Einstein metrics. Uh, a, a critical point is either Einstein or it's uh, scalar flat. It has scalar curvature identically zero. And of course, you can see that a scalar flat metric would be an absolute minimum of this non-negative functional. So th those are, if, if you try to, to uh, think about the problem this way, that this exceptional case is unavoidable. So uh, because the, the, the functional that we're talking about here is, uh, is uh, non-negative, uh, you might imagine trying to find Einstein metrics by minimizing this, uh, this functional. And so one is immediately presented with a rather interesting differential topological uh, invariant. Given a smooth compact in manifold, uh, one can take the uh, infimum of uh, this functional over the space of all metrics. And because we've, uh, <coughs> we've kind of washed away the metric dependence, this is something that only depends on the smooth compact uh, uh, manifold. And so uh, I call this um, I sub S of M, obviously S, refers to the scalar curvature. For some reason I'm not getting any. Uh, the, uh, whereas uh, I stands for uh, interesting uh, infimum integral invariant. So um, let me just switch batteries on this thing so that it seems it's acting as if the battery's low. All right, so um, the basic question is, uh, what can one say about this invariant? <laughs> so the uh, basic theorem though, so this, this is something you could assign to any, uh, any smooth compact in manifold. Um, and in particular, one might consider uh, what is this number attached to uh, a simply connected in manifold. So remember the original motivation for considering this is maybe you want to try to find an Einstein metric by minimizing this. But if, uh, if the dimension is not four, then in fact, this infimum on a simply connected manifold is always zero. And so in particular, if you're trying to minimize this, what you've probably had is maybe a scalar flat metric rather than an Einstein metric. By contrast though, um, there exist uh, uh, sequences of simply connected four manifolds uh, for which this, uh, this infimum actually uh, goes to plus infinity. So in dimension four, this, leads to, this actually leads to a very interesting smooth manifold invariant. And in fact, uh, one can even choose sequences of simply connected four manifolds so that uh, the infimum is actually a minimum. In fact, such that there is a, an Einstein metric which uh, achieves the minimum. So this is uh, indicative of the fact that um, for uh, problems involving uh, scalar curvature, there is some 
profound difference between dimension four and other dimensions. So what is so special about dimension four? Um, well, the, uh, the basic point is that the uh, rotation group in four dimensions is not a simple Lie group. It's Lie algebra is in fact uh, the sum of two copies of um, SO3. This says that after all, so the Lie algebra of SO4 is the skew four by four matrices. A, a, a skew four by four matrix can actually be uh, represented in a, in a canonical way as a pair of skew three by three matrices. But on the other hand, um, in terms of the way that the rotation group acts on skew matrices, that's also exactly, you can also think of a skew matrix as really representing a two form in a particular basis. And the way that the rotation group acts uh, on, on two forms is exactly the same way that it acts on its own Lie algebra by the adjoint representation. So this splitting of the, of the, four, uh, of, of the six dimensional Lie algebra of, uh, of, of SO4 into two th three dimensional Lie algebras SO3 is, is mirrored on uh, uh, any oriented uh, uh, Riemannian four manifold by a splitting of the two forms into two rank three bundles. Uh, in fact, those are just the eigenspaces of the, of the Hodge star operator. And so uh, because of that, the, uh, the two, these two uh, subbundles are called the self-dual and the anti-self-dual two forms. They are the eigenspace plus one and eigenspace minus one uh, <coughs> uh, spaces of, uh, in the two forms. Now, uh, you can have always think of, of the Riemann curvature tensor as a, a self-adjoint map from two forms to two forms. And if you think about it in that way, then you see that in, in dimension four, the curvature splits up uh, into, into blocks uh, in terms of things that map self-dual uh, forms to self-dual forms, anti-self-dual uh, forms to self-dual forms, and so forth. Um, the off-diagonal uh, piece here turns out to be the trace-free part of the Ricci curvature, the scalar curvature appears as a multiple of the identity. And then the trace-free uh, pieces of these two blocks are actually two pieces of the vial tensor, which is the in conformally invariant piece of the, uh, of the curvature tensor. So in, in terms of, uh, of <coughs> uh, breaking up the curvature tensor into irreducible pieces, the story is different in dimension four than in other dimensions, because in dimension four, there, uh, there are really four essential pieces of the curvature tensor, the scalar curvature, trace-free Ricci curvature, self-dual vial, and anti-self-dual vial. If you were in dimension five or higher, the, the vial curvature would still make sense, but it wouldn't break up into two pieces. Uh, in dimension three, on the other hand, the vial you can still define the vial tensor, but it's actually zero. All right, so um, one uh, cute fact, which many of you are probably familiar with, is that uh, a four-dimensional uh, uh, Riemannian manifold is Einstein, if and only if the uh, if and only if the curvature operator commutes with the Hodge star. So that would end up saying that the trace-free Ricci curvature vanishes. So the Hodge star, and uh, if you think of it as a map from Two forms, two forms. Its block decomposition will be plus the, uh, the identity here, minus the identity there, and zero off the diagonal. And uh, so uh, that, in particular, means that uh, a Riemannian four manifold is uh, Einstein if and only if. Uh, so if you're given a two plane, it has a perpendicular two plane, which you can obviously see just by tilting your head a little bit. Uh, and um, so. Uh, the statement is that uh, the, the manifold you're looking at is Einstein if and only if for every two plane, the sectional curvature in that direction is the same as the sectional curvature in the uh, perpendicular plane. All right, so having seen the basic uh, curvature decomposition in dimension four, we could uh, ask about, well, what are, uh, what are invariants of four manifolds that are gotten by uh, 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 integrating, uh, integrating some polynomial expression in the curvature where the polynomial is required to be invariant under the orthogonal group. 
And if we also demand that this is a scale invariant, the only possibility in dimension four would be that the, that the polynomial has to be quadratic. And then it's a simple piece of uh, representation theory that the only, since the scalar curvature, the trace free Ricci curvature, W plus and W minus correspond to the irreducible, uh, 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 irreducible sub-representations of the, of the curvature representation of the orthogonal group. Um, so the only, the only uh, quadratic polynomials that are, uh, are uh, <laughs> invariant under the group are the scalar curvature squared, the uh, trace-free Ricci curvature squared, W plus squared, W minus squared, that's a basis for, so any other, uh, any other uh, in, invariant quadratic polynomial would be uh, a combination of those. But on the other hand, uh, these are not actually uh, independent. So we're here, if we're assuming that we're on a compact so here we have you know, four basic uh, 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 quadratic uh, curvature functionals on a four manifold, uh, but they're not really independent if we assume that uh, our manifold is, uh, is, is compact and oriented. Namely, uh, uh, there are two important homotopy invariants that you can express as, uh, uh, as curvature integrals. The first is the Euler characteristic, so the generalized uh, uh, Gauss-Binet theorem would tell you that in dimension 2n, there is an, a polynomial of degree n in the curvature whose integral gives you the Euler characteristic. And the coefficients happen to be in dimension 4, uh, the ones I've written down here. Uh, uh, by the way, a a Alice uses a different convention about what, she, what, what is meant by the norm of, of w plus or w minus. In, in my convention, w plus is thought of as being living in two forms, tensor two forms. And that, uh, in, that, uh, that difference introduces a factor of four. So some of you may have seen uh, some factors of four analysis lectures that, that don't appear here. Um, and then the signature is, is similarly gotten by integrating a multiple of uh, W plus squared minus W minus squared. So, um, so that means that if you have a fixed four manifold and you're going to consider any kind of uh, uh, variational problem, uh, arising from a quadratic uh, curvature functional, then it's in fact, um, ex you could, for example, express such a functional in terms of the integral of the scalar curvature squared and the uh, integral of the trace-free Ricci curvature squared. And then uh, if you want to then move from manifold to manifold, you would say, well, you have to add on some multiple of the Euler characteristic and the signature to that. But on a fixed manifold, uh, th these would be uh, uh, any any variational problem would be uh, equivalent to the ones uh, arising from some combination of these the, this, uh, these two basic functionals. So you might notice that uh, Einstein metrics are critical for both. I already uh, said that uh, uh, that uh, so in dimension uh, uh, n, if you look at this, the absolute value of the scalar curvature to the n over two, so that's the integral of scalar curvature squared. Any Einstein metric is a critical uh, point of that functional. And obviously, um, since the trace free Ricci curvature vanishes at an Einstein metric, um, uh, <clears throat> therefore it also vanishes to, to first order when you, uh, when, when, you, when you look at the variation of the second functional. So an Einstein metric is a critical point of either of these functionals. And so it follows that an Einstein metric is actually a, a, a critical point of every possible quadratic curvature functional in dimension four. And so, for example, if you were to look at the, uh, the integral of W plus squared, then it would turn out that uh, an Einstein metric could also be uh, a, a critical point of that. And this will come up in the, the second lecture when we discuss the Bach equations. <laughs> All right. Uh, in fact, the basis I, I prefer to usually work with is uh, instead to look at the uh, integral of the scalar curvature squared and the integral of W plus squared. And in, in these lectures, uh, I'll be uh, ex explaining uh, results about uh, both of these functionals. And uh, one major theme, which appeared in the title of the, appears in the title of the theories is uh, under, under uh, suitable circumstances, can one say anything systematic about the comparison between the size of these uh, functionals? In particular, you might say for an Einstein metric, uh, how, what, is there any systematic relationship between the 
uh, the size of the integral of scalar curvature squared and the size of W plus squared. And so that's why the, the phrase curvature in the balance occurs in the, uh, in the, the title of the, uh, of the series. All right, so we've, uh, I print, we've, I've mentioned that there are these two basic quantities uh, that can be expressed in, in terms of uh, quadratic curvature integrals. Uh, one of them is the signature, and if you, uh, it's important that you know what the signature is. Um, so uh, the signature is the difference between two important invariants, the B plus and B minus, that are defined in terms of the intersection pairing. So on a, on a compact oriented four manifold, there is a pairing from, uh, there, uh, from uh, there, there is a, an invariant, uh, typically in, uh, indefinite inner product, uh, on, uh, on the second cohomology. So on Durham cohomology, you could just say, given two closed two forms, you could wedge them together and uh, integrate. And more abstractly, this has to do with the cut product from H2 times H2 to H4. So um, Poincaré du duality says that this is a non-degenerate pairing. Um, and uh, on the other hand, any, uh, uh, any, any, um, any inner product can be diagonalized. So um, in fact, uh, you can always find a basis in which uh, uh, this pairing becomes simply uh, represented by a matrix with only plus ones and minus ones as entries. And the number of plus ones here is, uh, is called B plus and the number of minus ones is called B minus. More abstractly, B plus is the maximum dimension of a subspace of the second cohomology on which the intersection pairing is positive definite, whereas B minus is the maximum dimension of a subspace of, of H2 on which the intersection pairing is negative definite. There's a, but there's an important way of uh, understanding this in terms of Hodge theory. So if you're on a compact Riemannian manifold, um, any, uh, any cohomology, any, uh, uh, any element of the second cohomology could be represented by a harmonic two form. So that's a, a would be a two form, which is both closed and co-closed. And um, since uh, Hodge star acts on the space of, of, uh, of these harmonic forms, um, you can, uh, with square uh, the identity, you can break this up into the plus uh, one eigenspace and the minus one eigenspace. But when you stare at this, it turns out that what you're really saying is that you can express any harmonic form as a, a self-dual harmonic form plus an anti-self-dual harmonic form. And what is a self-dual harmonic form? It's simply a self-dual two form, which happens to be closed. So if it's, because it's its own Hodge star, if it's closed, it's also co-closed. And the same thing, of course, works for uh, anti-self-dual forms. But in fact, when you take an L2 uh, orthonormal basis, uh, you can take an L2 orthonormal basis for H plus and L2 orthonormal basis for H minus, the intersection pairing would exactly uh, give you that previous uh, matrix with uh, plus ones and minus ones on the diagonal. So B plus is exactly the dimension of harmonic, of the harmonic self-dual uh, two forms. B minus is exactly the dimension of the self-dual harmonic two forms. So <clears throat> for a given metric, there is a, there is a decomposition of, uh, of the second cohomology into a self-dual subspace and an anti-self-dual su subspace. But the warning is that as you vary the metric, um, you will actually get a de different decomposition. Um, so <clears throat> it's, it is imp uh, one other important fact though, is that the condition for a two form to be self-dual self is, conformally invariant in dimension four. And similarly for it to be anti-self-dual is conformally invariant in, in dimension four. And certainly the condition to be closed, is, it doesn't have any, anything to do with the metric. So if we were only changing the metric by multiplying it by a conformal factor, but multiply it by some po positive function, then that does not change this decomposition. But in general, as you vary among metrics, you will get a different decomposition. All right. so. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one little cute fact, which uh, people often will know this is, a, I mean, you know, it's, I learned from the scripture that this is true, but some people never ask why these things are true. 
um, the Euler characteristic is can also be thought of as uh, the pairing of the Euler class of the tangent bundle with uh, the, the fundamental class of the manifold. Uh, a, an amazing theorem discovered in the 50s by Re Rene Tom and then generalized later by Hirzebruck, who often gets all the credit, uh, is that for a four manifold, the, the signature is the same as the pairing of the first Pontryagin class of the tangent bundle with the fundamental cycle. And um, so both of these things, are the, for any uh, vector bundle with, uh, with a connection which preserves an inner product, positive definite inner product, the Euler class is represented by a certain closed form. And similarly, um, it, it built out of the curvature. And similarly, the first Pontryagin class is represented in, it can be represented in terms of the curvature of an arbitrary connection on the vector bundle. So that says that both of these things must arise as uh, curvature integrals. And that's why we have these kinds of, of formulas. The proof of, uh, of Tom's discovery that the signature only depends, is actually a statement about the first Pontryagin uh, class of the tangent bundle. Uh, the original proof of this, later, later these both become uh, special cases of the index theorem, but the original proof is very beautiful. It's that um, Tom observed that both the first Pontryagin class uh, and the signature of a four manifold are cobordism invariants. So if you, if you have uh, a five manifold whose, uh, whose uh, uh, boundary, uh, you have an oriented five, ma uh, oriented five manifold whose boundary consists of two uh, uh, four manifolds, um, and uh, you then think of, of uh, them, uh, one of them is giving the, the opposite orientation. So if, you, if you're thinking of uh, the, the, the boundary of, a, of, an, of an oriented manifold has a boundary orientation. And here uh, we're thinking of, instead, we want to think of this as a generalization of the cylinder so that one end should be really thought of as, as not having the, having the in-pointing orientation rather than the out-pointing orientation. So that's the condition on, on uh, M and N being cobordant. And uh, it's, a, it's, if you like, a, it, it's, a, it's a nice uh, uh, exercise in uh, <coughs> Poincaré-Alexander uh, duality that the signature is invariant under cobordism and it's Stokes theorem that the first Pontryagin number is, is invariant under cobordism. And then the last, the punchline of, of that argument is that Tom shows that in dimension four, uh, that uh, when you look at the cobordism group tensor Q, it's actually one dimension. So that means that these two invariants have to be, a, one has to be a multiple of the other, check, the, check it for one example, you find out that the, the, the coefficient is three. All right, so, um, so um, I've said that, that I'm going to, to tell you things about uh, both of these uh, basic quadratic uh, curvature functionals in uh, dimension four, and then we'll try to, to uh, find out uh, how, it, you know, when and how uh, these two uh, functionals can be related in some sy systematic way. So um, I'll begin by discussing uh, the integral of the scalar curvature squared. In fact, of course, that's more or less where I started this lecture. Um, one thing that uh, should be well known, but uh, I think is not all that well known, is that this is actually related to the Amabi problem. So uh, just want to remind you that if you have a smooth compact uh, N manifold where N is at least three, um, uh, the, a, a, a different uh, variational formula, uh, different variational problem that gives rise to the Einstein metrics, and this is a cleaner result really, is uh, one can instead look at the normalized Einstein-Hilbert functional. So Hilbert originally uh, asked what were the critical points of the integral of the scalar curvature, um, but that's not a scale invariant thing. It's nicer to instead multiply this by a power of the volume so that if you multiply the metric by a constant, it doesn't change the functional. So, that's the, so this is often called now the normalized Einstein-Hilbert functional. And it's, uh, it's it turns out its critical points are exactly the Einstein metrics. So the basic difficulty with this, uh, unlike the original functional I discussed, which was non-negative, um, this functional is uh, actually not bounded above or bounded below on any manifold. 
on any manifold, you can find sequences of metrics for which this goes to plus infinity and sequences of metrics for which it goes to minus infinity. But uh, in the late 50s, Yamabe uh, uh, thought about this and discovered the crucial fact that this is actually bounded below in any conformal class. So if you look at metrics that are, are uh, arbitrary function times a fixed metric, then uh, this is actually uh, bounded below. And um, the, uh, the, the usual uh, uh, yoga for doing this, Yamabe actually discovered that there is a, a, a critical exponent in dimension n, which is 2n divided by n minus 2. And there are a couple of ways of remembering this. So for example, p over 2 is the Holder conjugate of n over 2. I'll use that in a moment. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, concretely, the way I tend to remember this, I don't tend to remember this number off the, off, uh, uh, off the bat, but if you remember that you want to um, imagine uh, changing a metric by multiplying it by u to the p minus 2 and demand simultaneously that that uh, rescales the volume form by multiplying it by u to the p, then you would uh, deduce from this that p must be 2n divided by n minus 2. If you make that choice, uh, then uh, Yamali discovered this amazingly simple formula for how the sc scalar curvature rescales. And you'll notice that everything is written in terms of this number p. I mean, most people just remember there's some list of constants you're supposed to remember. They're all built out of this p. So if you multiply, so here I use the positive spectrum Laplacian. That was the opposite uh, uh, convention that, uh, well, so I, I'm a geometer, not an analyst, and a lot of a lot of geometers are now convinced that uh, <coughs> that Laplace got the sign wrong. Uh, so um, anyway, the uh, so if you use this sign convention on the Laplacian, uh, applying the linear operator p plus two times the Laplacian plus the scalar curvature to u gives you the scalar curvature of the rescale metric times u to the p minus one. And in particular, the, uh, the Einstein-Hilbert functional restricted to a conformal class. Uh, so here, using some background metric uh, G and then uh, writing out uh, what the Einstein-Hilbert functional is for a rescale metric G, it takes this beautiful form that looks essentially, it's, it's like an L21 uh, norm, but well, with the scalar curvature appearing as a coefficient here, uh, divided by the uh, LP norm squared. So uh, the, the basic difficulty, so Yamabe was aware of the fact that, that first there was a, there is a continuous inclusion of L21 into LP, but it, it's not compact. If you replace P with, uh, if you replace uh, P in, this, in the denominator with a slightly smaller number, P minus epsilon, uh, then uh, the corresponding uh, uh, inclusion is actually compact and they're kind of naive ways of finding the minimizer group. So Yamabe believed uh, before his premature death, he published a paper in 1960, but he'd already died by that time, uh, that, uh, that, any, uh, that any conformal class contained uh, a minimizer of the Einstein-Hilbert functional. And, um, and then uh, Trudinger in the 1960s discovered that there was a gap he fixed it in the, in the case when your background metric has non-positive scalar curvature. And then he proposed a way of approaching the problem in uh, using Sobolev spaces that could be, uh, that would work in the positive case if you only knew the Sobolev constants. And uh, Aubin then realized that there was, a, there was a geometric interpretation of the relevant uh, Sobolev constant. And uh, he, he therefore fixed uh, Yamabe's proof in most cases. And then the remaining cases of uh, low dimensions or conformally flat manifolds uh, was repaired by uh, Shane. That was the, last, the capstone of the whole process where Shane's uh, argument depends on the fact that uh, the positive mass theorem was known in low dimensions. So there, in any conformal class, there is a metric which minimizes the Einstein-Hilbert functional and that metric has constant scalar curvature. It's not in general the, the only positive, it's not the only constant scalar curvature uh, metric in some conformal classes, um, but uh, there, there are uh, situations in which you can say uh, that, that it is unique. So, um, so there is a metric which achieves this in FEMA. It's, a, it's actually a minimum in any conformal class. On the other hand, uh, 
<coughs> cute fact is that uh, if you look at the n over two norm of the scalar curvature with respect to your given metric, that's always uh, uh, greater than the uh, Einstein-Hilbert functional just by the <coughs> just by the uh, Hulder inequality and the fact that n over two and uh, and p over two are Hulder conjugates. And uh, uh, you would find, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, this, this, this is from the wrong slide, sorry. So, um, uh, so, so uh, um, this is, the statement is wrong. Uh, so, um, oh, I'm sorry. If you do it for the particular metric, yeah, you would find that, that the, you have an equal, equality here if and, if and only if the scalar curvature is constant. Um, uh, in the negative case, uh, rather than just comparing the, uh, the, the uh, n over two norm uh, for the given metric uh, of the scalar curvature, you could also ask, well, what, what about uh, Einstein-Hilbert functional of uh, other metrics can, in the conformal class? And here you can use the, the same Holder inequality in a kind of opposite way. If you look at this functional and then you say, well, it's bigger than what I would get by throwing away uh, the derivative term and then just apply the Holder inequality to uh, <laughs> to uh, the original metric, then you would find that uh, a lower bound for the uh, for the uh, Einstein-Hilbert functional is always minus the n over two norm of the scalar curvature of any metric in the conformal class. And here you would get uh, equality uh, if and only if uh, the scalar curvature of uh, of your metric G is constant, and if U that relates the two metrics is uh, is constant. So one co corollary of that argument, this is not the usual proof, but one corollary of this argument is that uh, in the negative case, uh, when, the, when, the, <coughs> when the Amabi, so the Amabi invariant is in fact always plus or minus the enthemum of the n over two norm of the scalar curvature in a, in, in a conformal class. In the case where the, uh, where the, the invariant is, is negative or, or, or non-positive, then, the, then, then in fact, there's, essentially a unique uh, minimizer. The, the, oh, there's only one constant scalar curvature metric up to an overall scale, uh, up to multiplying it by a constant. Uh, but, in the, but that argument is, is certainly is, is not true in the positive case. And it turns out that there are all kinds of uh, problems with non-uniqueness. An annoyance in the subject is if you're given a constant scalar curvature metric um, uh, with positive scalar curvature, it, there is no easy way in general to determine whether it is, it is uh, uh, the Amabi minimizer or not. Uh, one exception is Obata's theorem, which would tell you that, if it, that an Einstein metric is always uh, a Yamabi minimizer. All right, so, um, so that was the story about uh, the, uh, the, the Yamabi problem, and uh, that relates it to the previous uh, uh, story about uh, the n over two norm of scalar curvature. So um, <coughs> the <coughs> so we've seen that the that uh, any conformal class contains a, a minimizer of the Einstein-Hilbert functional, and uh, th that uh, uh, and that uh <coughs> so Obaz's uh, main uh, observation was that uh, the <coughs> that this, this constant for any conformal class is necessarily less than uh, or equal to that of the round sphere. And uh, his argument was that if, if you had strict inequality, there existed a minimizer. So there's a standard trick given a conformal class, you take a, any metric looks like Euclidean metric plus uh, a, a quadratic deviation when you look at it at a small scale. And it looks more and more like the Euclidean metric as you zoom in. So just by kind of using the, the obvious conformal factor to get from Euclidean space to the sphere, you can uh, find sequences of metrics where the, 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 the energy is not very far from that of the sphere. So uh, the, the, the punchline of the Obash and Shane uh, <coughs> contributions to the problem was to show that in fact, uh, you would get equality uh, only in the case of the round sphere. Otherwise it's always strict inequality. Now, Yamabe published this paper on constant scalar curvature metrics. Uh, he did not publish anything about Einstein metrics, but he did tell uh, colleagues at Minnesota that he was really interested in using this to try to understand uh, Einstein metrics. And so the idea is that in every conformal class, uh, you can find, uh, uh, you can minimize this functional. 
Um, and then what you might try to do is uh, uh, find a critical point by a mountain pass procedure or a minimax procedure. You minimize in every conformal class and then uh, ma try to maximize uh, over conformal classes and hope then there might be uh, a critical point that arises in that way. Well, this is just too good to be true. We now know that there are lots of manifolds that do not admit Einstein metrics, but uh, this does at least get, give rise to an important, uh, important invariant of a smooth compact manifold, uh, which I refer to, which many people now call the Yamabe invariant. Uh, and th so that is an invariant that just depends on the smooth manifold. It's the supremum of all Yamabe constants over all conformal classes. Um, this has uh, other names. Um, uh, in 1987, uh, Shane and uh, Osamu Kabayashi independently um, uh, discussed this invariant and gave it different names. Uh, Shane called it the sigma constant. Uh, uh, Kobayashi called it the mu invariant. And uh, in both cases, I would sort of say, well, um, you know, if so, if you mention, if you're talking to someone who's not a specialist in the field, they use the same Greek letter to mean other things, right? So it's much better just to call this the Yamabe invariant, which reminds you what con what's the context? It's about the Yamabe problem. So this is kind of the Yamabe minimax of a given manifold. So the the previous discussion gives us a a, a deep triviality. It's a, it's it's a, a slightly the, the argument is trivial once you've seen it and you've seen it now. It's that um, if you want to understand the infimum of the n over two norm of the, uh, the scalar curvature, so the, the infimum of the integral of, uh, of, of scalar curvature to the n over two power is zero if the Yamabe uh, in, invariant is, is positive. The Yamabe invariant positive means there's a positive scalar curvature metric. On the other hand, you can always find uh, other conformal classes where the Yamabe in, invariant, uh, Yamabe constant is negative and the Yamabe constant uh, varies continuously as you, as you change the conformal class. So there have to be conformal classes with Yamabe constant zero. That means there are constant, there are zero scalar curvature metrics on any such manifold. And then those are obviously the minimizers of the integral of the scalar curvature to the n over two power. Whereas if the Yamabe invariant is non-positive, um, the, this in, infimum of uh, this integral of scalar curvature to the n over two is actually the, the absolute value of the Yamabe invariant raised to the power n over two. Okay, so, um, so in, in fact, I, I was previously talking about, well, what can we say about the integral of the scalar curvature squared on a four manifold? And uh, what we, uh, we find is that, um, if you can show that that infimum is, is, non, is, is not zero, you've actually also, uh, that, that gives you a simpler way of understanding what the Yamabe invariant is. The Yamabe invariant is defined in terms of a minimax, sort of hard to understand and in, in, in carry out in, in practice. Whereas here for this, this uh, invariant IS, it's actually simply an infimum. All right, so the, the, the results I mentioned at the beginning of the, uh, of the lecture, um, if, if, you're, if you have a simply connected n manifold and n is not uh, equal to four, well, if the dimension is above five, Gromov and Lawson had shown, first of all, that taking connected sums uh, between of, of two manifolds with positive scalar curvature gives you a, 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 a metric of positive scalar curvature. But more generally, they showed that if you did uh, surgery, that's a, that's a co-dimension n surgery. More generally, if you do uh, surgery in co-dimension at least three on a manifold, then positive scalar curvature, if you have a positive scalar curvature metric beforehand, you can find one afterwards. So that says that that's a, that gives you a, a, a domain in which you can understand uh, which metrics admit positive scalar curvature. This breaks it down into a question about cobordism because cobordisms are built up out of elementary surgeries. And so in, in, uh, in dimension greater than or equal to five, uh, Gromov and Lawson had, uh, uh, were able to understand in the non-spin case when a simply connected manifold had a positive scalar curvature metric, the answer was always. Uh, and uh, in, in, so if you're in dimension at least five, um, they reduced the problem for the spin case down to a, a question about spin cobordism that was solved by Stefan Stoltz. 
Um, and then my student Jimmy Patian realized that you could actually improve these arguments because rather than asking about uh, positive scalar curvature, you could ask about when is the Yamabe invariant non-negative. So um, the point is that uh, for any simply connected n manifold where uh, n is not four, uh, the Yamabe invariant cannot be negative. Okay, so uh, so this doesn't uh, handle the case of dimension n is equal to three, but in dimension n equals three, the Poincaré conjecture was the only possibility was the three sphere that follows from uh, Perlman's uh, uh, solution of the Thurston geometrization conjectures. And so in fact, uh, in, except in, in, in dimension four, the Yamabe invariant of a simply connected uh, manifold must be uh, greater than or equal to zero. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the, I'll, I'll explain uh, in, in a few minutes uh, that uh, you can, by contrast, find sequences of compact simply connected four manifolds where the Yamabe invariant goes to minus infinity. And you can actually choose those manifolds so that the, that the, uh, <coughs> so that the uh, Yamabe minimax is actually realized by an Einstein metric. And so the, uh, the, the method of proof here involves cyborg witten theory, which only works in dimension four. So, uh, the, <coughs> so now just uh, uh, quoting our great, uh, our, our deep triviality, uh, we get these theorems about the behavior of the infimum in dimension four would be about the integral of the scalar curvature squared in dimension n about the inter absolute value of the scalar curvature to the n over two. Yeah, and so, yeah, it's perfect time uh, because this is now intermission. Yes. Yeah, again, sorry if this is a stupid question, but uh, how does this... Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I mean, if you're asking this, everyone is, is probably thinking about the same question. Uh, so like there's, there's obstructions to positive scalar curvature, right? Yeah. They, they had uh, genus for spin manifolds. And how does that compare to this uh, non-negativity of Yamabe? Right. So saying that the Yamabe invariant is equal to zero, I'm really glad you asked. Saying the Yamabe invariant is equal to zero does not mean that there is a zero scalar curvature metric on the manifold. It means that for every epsilon, you can find a unit volume metric whose scalar curvature is greater than minus epsilon everywhere, okay? So, um, so in the positive case, it happens that positive Yamabe invariant actually says there's a positive scalar curvature uh, metric. But since this, uh, you know, the, the definition of the Yamabe invariant is, is, a, is this minimax, you're taking the supremum of, of Yamabe constants, it would be saying that you could find Yamabe constants that were very close to zero. And that ends up saying that you can find a metric of constant scalar curvature minus epsilon and, and unit volume, no matter how small epsilon is. All right, so what happens in the, in, and one of the interesting things that, that happens here is that there are many uh, manifolds with Yamabe invariant zero, where you cannot uh, uh, find a, a zero scalar curvature metric. Typically, I mean, you could, you, you know, the A hat genus measures the, uh, the index of the Dirac operator. And so the, the dimension of its kernel uh, minus the dimension of its co-kernel. So if, uh, if, if that's non-zero, there must be some harmonic spinners. Uh, but the Lechnerowitz Weizenbach formula says that uh, if the scalar curvature is zero, any harmonic spinner is parallel, and therefore the, the number of, of uh, harmonic spinners must be bounded by the dimension of the spin, the rank of the spin bundle. So there's some universal constant, depending on the dimension, it's exponential in the dimension, where if the A hat genus is bigger than that, you know that you can't have a zero scalar curvature metric on the spin manifold. So in general, uh, typically these Yamabe invariants are not achieved. They are, it's a, it's, it's, so in a conformal class, the Yamabe constant of the conformal class is actually a minimum. But when you now try to maximize the Yamabe constants, you can, there are many obstructions to actually being able to find a mountain pass metric. They typically don't exist. <clears throat> All right, so we've just seen that, uh, that we can define this uh, Yamabe invariant of any smooth compact in manifold. Uh, typically, we put in a constraint that it's not equal to uh, the dimension is not two, and, but in dimension two, this would be just a, a strange way of talking about the Euler characteristic. Um, 
by the by classical Gauss Binet. Um, so what I've, I've tried to convince you is that for the, this kind of problem involving the scalar curvature, there's something peculiarly different about uh, dimension four from uh, higher dimensions or from dimension three. So uh, to see this, uh, this assertion about uh, uh, the existence of uh, sequences of four manifolds, um, <clears throat> let's just, uh, the, the, the key to that is the following observation. If you have a compact Kähler-Einstein uh, manifold uh, <clears throat> of complex dimension two, and that means of real dimension four, then uh, <clears throat> it, provided the Einstein constant is uh, non-positive, then uh, the, that metric actually achieves the Yamabe invariant of the manifold. And so if you accept that, you just can then read off that uh, this uh, invariant gotten by minimizing the integral of the scalar curvature squared uh, is actually 32 uh, pi squared C1 squared of the manifold. And the Yamabe invariant is actually minus four pi times the square root of two C1 squared of, of the manifold. So here I've stated, so, uh, let, so an important warning, uh, Many people talk about the Kähler Einstein problem as if it's some something, it's some analog of the Einstein problem. It's a special case, right? So, a, a Kähler Einstein metric is an Einstein metric that happens to also be Kähler, it has special holonomy. Namely, there's an almost complex structure which is uh, invariant under parallel transport, and such a thing is necessarily integrable. And then it's a technical fact that from this natural condition about the holonomy of the Riemannian metric, you can. Well, you can express it in terms of I have a fixed complex structure and I have a special kind of symplectic form called the Kähler form that determines the metric. Uh, here in these formulas, um, uh, I've used uh, uh, the, the first Chern class squared. So the first Chern class uh, it depends on the almost complex structure. Um, and when I take it square, I mean, you, you think of it as an element of the second cohomology and that uh, has a pairing with itself under this uh, intersection product, which actually maps integer cohomology to uh, integers. Um, <clears throat> so the first churn class of the almost complex structure definitely depends on the almost complex structure. For example, if you take, even given an integrable complex structure, you can always multiply it by minus one. That's the conjugate complex structure, and that would change the sign of C1. Typically on a four manifold though, there are infinitely many different uh, uh, elements of cohomology that are first churn classes of almost complex structures. But here I'm talking about the one that's associated with the Kähler-Einstein metric. Uh, fortunately, whichever almost complex structure you choose, um, uh, C1 squared is actually uh, twice the Euler characteristic plus three times the signature of the manifold. And this is really, this boils down to the fact that what you're really calculating here is the first Pontryagin number of the bundle lambda plus of self-dual uh, two forms. Okay, so um, the, the method of proof, which I'll tell you about in a moment, involves uh, cyberg witten theory. Uh, but uh, before I go on to that, so this is about uh, uh, Kähler-Einstein metrics with lambda uh, non-positive. Uh, by contrast, uh, one could ask what happens in the uh, positive case so if you have a Kähler-Einstein metric with a positive Einstein constant, um, then that metric achieves the Yamabe invariant of the manifold if and only if your manifold is CP2. Um, and in this case, it turns out there's only one complex structure uh, up to isomorphism, and the, there's only one Kähler-Einstein metric, namely the standard fubini studi metric on, on CP2. So, uh, but, so the, actually the hard part of the statement is that this occurs for, uh, uh, this does occur for, for CP2. This, the fubini studi metric does achieve the, uh, the Yamabe invariant. This is a, a case where Yamabe's dream comes true. Um, and the Yamabe invariant of CP2 is, uh, in particular, it's not the same as the Yamabe invariant of the four sphere, it's strictly less. Um, uh, for there are, other uh, Kähler-Einstein uh, four manifolds, uh, things of real dimension four, complex dimension two, with lambda positive. 
in all of those other cases, the Yamabe invariant of the manifold is actually bigger than the Einstein-Hilbert functional of the metric. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, it's courtesy of a theorem of uh, Matt Gursky, one can show that uh, on all of the kähler einstein manifolds with positive lambda in, uh, in, in real dimension four, that among Einstein metrics, the, uh, among Einstein metrics, the uh, kähler einstein metric does achieve a, a max, has maximum Einstein-Hilbert uh, functional. So, but in, in these other cases, uh, there is no uh, Einstein metric that achieves so initially you might, uh, you might worry, well, maybe there's some other Einstein metric that achieves the Yamabe minimax. No, there is no Einstein metric that achieves it on any of these other uh, uh, four manifolds. And I'll explain what they are. Uh, in, it'll, the, the, the other things that come up are so-called del Pezzo surfaces. And I'll talk about those at length later. So the, uh, the, the first proof of this uh, involved uh, a perturbed version of the, uh, Yama, of, of the cyber witten equations. But then uh, Matt Gursky uh, and I collaborated. Uh, Matt proposed a much simpler proof, and uh, it actually gives better results. So uh, the cyborg witten equations involve uh, spin C Dirac operators, but um, th this second argument uh, uh, uses a different choice of what the curvature of the uh, associated line bundle is chosen to be. And uh, this is a more robust argument. It shows that uh, there are a number of other four manifolds, in fact, infinitely many other four manifolds that have the property that um, <laughs> their Yamabe uh, invariants are positive and uh, nonetheless uh, less than the, the, the sphere. Uh, it is an open problem to show that this ever happens in higher dimensions. Can you find a five manifold, a seven manifold, a 10 manifold where, the, where it has a positive scalar curvature metric, but where you can show that the the maximum Yamabe constant, the supremum Yamabe constants is less than that of the sphere. Just not known. In dimension three, it, it, Bray and Neves uh, showed that, uh, that it does happen. Specifically, it happens for, uh, for example, for uh, RP3 has uh, Yamabe constant less than, uh, Yamabe invariant less than that of the, of the three sphere. All right, so um, uh, previously I, I uh, this story has been about uh, uh, kähler einstein metrics, so let's just uh, see some examples. If you, for concreteness, let's take a, um, a hypersurface, complex hypersurface in CP3, which is smooth, doesn't have any singularities, and uh, of degree L. So a, a typical case, and it's topologically, the, these are all the same, but you could, for example, take the Fermat equation, where you take the sum of the, uh, uh, of the Elf powers of the non-projective uh, of, of the homogeneous coordinates. And that defines a smooth hypersurface in, uh, in CP3. It's, so a cartoon version is, it, this is sort of the, it's like taking this picture in R3, uh, it, uh, complexifying the coordinates so you get something in C3 and then taking the clo closure uh, by, um, <coughs> uh, to, to, to get something in the projective space rather than in affine space. And here to draw this cartoon, I've changed, had to change for the real variables. I put some eyes in so that the real locus would be non-empty. Um, so, um, if uh, so, so these uh, all of these hypersurfaces admit uh, kähler einstein metrics, and uh, so um, in for uh, large values of of L, L at least five. This was proved by. Implicitly, it's, it follows from work of Aubin and Yao. For uh, L equals four, it, it uh, follows from work of Yao. Uh, L equals three case is, uh, was first done by Xu, specifically for the Fermat hypersurface I've written down. All right, so, um, so you have on each of these, uh, there are kähler einstein metrics. For example, if L is one, you're looking at a hyperplane at CP2, um, the sign of the scalar curvature of that kähler einstein metric is positive. And this does achieve the Yamabe invariant. Uh, if you, on the other hand, if you take a degree two hypersurface, that would be CP1 times CP1, and, uh, and it's isomorphic to CP1 times CP1. And that, uh, that has a kähler einstein metric, the, mainly the product of two round two spheres of, let's say, the same radius. Um, but that Einstein metric does not uh, achieve the Yamabe invariant. Um, if you were to look at uh, the degree three hypersurface, a cubic, 
it's a beautiful uh, classical piece of algebraic geometry that that's actually CP2 blown up at six points uh, that admits a Kähler-Einstein metric, but it does not achieve uh, the Amab invariant. Um, if, for, if we look at something of degree four, that's, an, uh, that's uh, a typical example of a K3 surface. Any K3 surface would be, uh, would be diffeomorphic to, to this guy for when L is equal to four. That has a, a Ricci flat Kähler metric, and that actually does uh, achieve the Yamabe invariant of the manifold. Um, uh, when L is at least five, these are so-called surfaces of general type. In fact, uh, the canonical line bundle is ample. And on all of these, uh, there is a Kähler-Einstein metric and it does achieve the, uh, the Yamabe invariant. So here we have an infinite sequence in the case when the uh, Einstein constant uh, is, is negative. Um, in fact, for these ex examples, C1 squared is the degree times uh, the degree minus four squared. And so uh, it, it, the Yamabe invariance, if you believe the previous formula, would be given by minus four pi times L, uh, L minus four times the square root of two L, provided that uh, L is at least four. And of course, these numbers go to minus infinity. <clears throat> All right, so these are also simply connected examples by the uh, Lefschetz hyperplane section theorem. And uh, so that shows you that in fact, this, the situation for this question is wildly different in dimension four than in higher dimensions. Now, the fact that, um, the, 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 fact that uh, the story is different in dimension four than in higher dimensions is related to the fact that the Yamabe invariant, while it's a diffeomorphism invariant, it turns out not to be a homeomorphism invariant. You can find lots of four manifolds that are homeomorphic to each other, but which have different Yamabe invariants. So in, in fact, the, if you're asking about the topological type, the homeomorphism type of smooth, compact, simply connected four manifolds, the answer is amazingly simple. It's, the proof is extremely difficult. Friedman got the, uh, the Fields Medal for proving most of this theorem and the remaining part uh, was proved by Donaldson in his thesis and they shared the Fields Medal in, in uh, the mid eighties. Um, so in fact, if you're given uh, uh, two smooth compact four manifolds and you want to determine whether they're homeomorphic, it turns out uh, by combining the work of Friedman and Donaldson, you can read off this simple criterion. If they have the same Euler characteristic and they have the same signature and they're both spin or they're both non-spin, then they're homeomorphic. That's all you have to know. A different way of saying it is that they have the same value of B plus, they have the same value of B minus, and they're both spin or they're both non-spin. So they both have second Stiefel Whitney class zero or they both have uh, second Stiefel Whitney class non-zero, then they're homeomorphic. So for example, if we look at these, uh, these hypersurfaces, um, if L is uh, odd, these are actually uh, uh, non-spin. And uh, so that classification uh, theorem will actually show you that uh, these are all uh, homeomorphic to connected sums of CP2 and CP2 bar, where uh, you have the, the number of CP2s is actually B plus, and the number of CP2 bars here is uh, B minus, and those both are uh, grow cubically in the, uh, in the degree. So uh, here the convention is that CP2 bar, it looks like CP2 bar, you'd think complex conjugation has nothing to do with complex conjugation. Uh, it's like that picture where I drew a, a cobordism theory, when you reverse the orientation of a manifold that's denoted, you have an oriented manifold, if you put a bar over it, it says take the opposite orientation. CP2 has a usual orientation coming from its complex structure. CP2 bar means the same manifold, but with the non-standard, the non-complex -compl orientation. And connected sum is the operation where you start with two smooth, compact oriented manifolds of the same dimension. You throw away a ball, standard ball from each and then glue them together on the boundary. It's just the way you would make a surface of genus two by starting with two, two, uh, two tori, the analog of that in higher dimensions. So the, you get an orientation on the manifold which induces the uh, given orientations on the two pieces. All right. so. Um, so in fact, 
uh, it, for simply connected uh, non-spin uh, four manifolds, they're always uh, connected sums of, uh, uh, of a certain number of CP2s and a certain number of copies of CP2 bars, where number K here is B plus and where the number L is uh, B minus. And I should have used a different letter. The black L is different from the purple L. Um, uh, on the other hand, the Gromov loss in surgery result, and by the way, for the connected sums, that was also done independently by Yao and Shane. Um, if you take the connected sum of two manifolds that have positive scalar curvature, you can find a positive scalar curvature metric on the connected sum. CP2 has a positive scalar curvature metric, say the, the fubini studi metric, right? And then if you reverse the orientation, it still has positive scalar curvature. Now you can glue them together and get positive scalar curvature. So if you say this as a smooth manifold, it's different from that guy as a smooth manifold. They're homeomorphic, but one admits positive scalar curvature metrics and the other has negative Yamabe invariant. So the Yamabe invariant here is detecting the fact that this, this topological four manifold uh, admits exotic smooth structures. And they're not so exotic. I mean, they're kind of naturally existing, right? What could be, if you're saying, let's just try to find some four manifolds. Why don't you look at complex hypersurfaces in CP3 or more generally smooth uh, projective varieties of complex dimension two. So uh, if L is even, these are, are, are non-spin manifolds and uh, one would uh, uh, then show that uh, <laughs> the, same, the same theorem then says that these are homeomorphic to connected sums of K3s and S2 times S2. Remember K3 was the case, if, if L was four here, that would be so-called K3, it's one of the basic building blocks of four-dimensional topology. The number of, of K3s is uh, cubic in, in, uh, in the degree, and the number of S2 times S2s is also cubic in the degree. Now, uh, Petian's theorem uh, about uh, the behavior of the Mabi uh, uh, invariant under connected sums, uh, or more generally co-dimension three surgery, would, would say that the Yamabi, uh, uh, <coughs> the Yamabi in, invariant of, uh, of, of uh, uh, of this connected sum must be greater than or equal to zero. But on the other hand, uh, the, the index of the Dirac operator is non-zero non on this, uh, provided that K is at least one. And uh, so uh, that doesn't can't admit positive scalar curvature metrics. So these are manifolds with, with the, the most obvious smooth structure. That's something where the Yamabe invariant is zero. And on the other hand, We've also seen that, uh, that these guys instead have negative Yamabe invariant. So again, the Yamabe invariant is detecting the fact there are different smooth uh, structures on the given uh, manifold. A cute point here is that it's, uh, one can easily see that um, this Yamabe, the question was asked before, what does it really mean for the Yamabe invariant to be zero? Does it mean there's a zero scalar curvature metric? No. There is no zero scalar curvature metric on such a connected sum. And uh, the reason is, well, it, 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 you know, provided that uh, L is non-zero and, and, and K is, uh, is, uh, uh, is at least two, uh, or if an or, or K is at least two. Um, so this does not admit uh, a zero scalar curvature metric. And it's exactly because there would be too many parallel spinners. The, 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 uh, <coughs> the, uh, the index of the Dirac operator here would be two little, uh, would be, uh, would be four times little k, and that's bigger than the rank of the, uh, of of s plus, which is two, uh, complex rank two. All right, so um, all of these things come out of the theory of uh, of spin c structures, or uh, cyborg witten theory depends on the theory of spin c structures. If you have a uh, a four manifold then uh, you can always find uh, integer classes in the second cohomology that reduce mod two to, uh, uh, to the second Stiefel-Whitney class. Uh, this is uh, easy to see in the simply connected case, the, the, the fact that it's true and uh, even uh, if the fundamental group is, is non-trivial, is, is say uh, in particular has two, <laughs> if the fundamental group is, is, is non-trivial, this becomes much harder. But in the simply connected case, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to show this. Still true though with ar for arbitrary fundamental group. So on any four manifold, you can find uh, uh, complex line bundles with uh, first churn class reducing mod two to the second Stiefel-Whitney class. 
um, and uh, and we'll always now think of them as as equipped with uh, a fixed Hermitian inner product. All right, so uh, given a, a metric G on M, that then implies that there are rank two uh, uh, Hermitian vector bundles called V plus and V minus, which uh, formally look like um, <coughs> the spin bundles twisted by square roots of L. Now, this is a kind of formal expression. It's a useful way of thinking about it. On a non, if the manifold is not spin, you don't have spin bundles, and you cannot, if since C one of L reduces to something mod two, which is non-zero, L does not have a square root. But you could try to say what are the transition functions for this, uh, and so there would be a, a sign problem with defining the transition functions for S plus. There'd be a a, a, a sign problem in defining the tr transition functions of uh, L to the one half, and fortunately those cancel. So in the case that we'll be uh, most interested in, uh, you don't need to apply to uh, think about uh, the, the obstruction theory to see that this is true. So a, a, a naive and important case is suppose that your manifold admits an almost complex structure, and then an almost complex structure determines a spin C structure. So the, the most interesting spin C structures are the ones that come from almost complex structures. So if you take um, the uh, so-called anti-canonical line bundle of an almost complex structure, that be the bundle of zero two forms, then uh, actually these, uh, these things that are formally twisted spin bundles are simply, uh, for, for this choice of L would be, you take the uh, zero P forms where P is uh, even and where it's odd. So the second bundle, a different way of thinking about this is it's the tangent bundle thought of as a complex vector bundle using the almost complex structure. And this is the trivial bundle plus, well, wedge two of the, of, of the tangent bundle. So he, here we get two rank two complex vector bundles. Um, in the Kähler case, you could actually uh, concretely identify those with these twisted spin bundles in a way that even the connections would, uh, would, uh, would uh, uh, ma uh, match up. Um, Instead, there's, a, there's an extra term in defining the connections in, for the general almost complex structure. The Nienhaus tensor appears in the formula for the connection. But in any case, you can think of these two bundles as, uh, as formally being thought of as, as, as twisted versions of the spin bundles. Even, so you can have, there are many uh, uh, four manifolds that are non-spin, but still have almost complex uh, structures. In fact, we just saw a bunch of, of complex manifolds that were not spin. All right, so, um, um, so in fact, a, a spin C structure uh, arises from some almost complex structure if and only of C1 squared of, that, uh, uh, of, the, of the line bundle L appearing in the discussion is this invariant two chi plus three tau. So, um, so in, in fact, for current purposes, it's just enough to think about the case when your four manifold admits an almost complex structure. All right, so now for every unitary connection uh, on our Hermitian line bundle, you get a, a spin C Dirac operator. Uh, and in the Kähler case, uh, up to a factor of square root of two, that would simply be the D bar operator plus D bar star. So D bar plus D bar star sends zero P forms for P even to zero P forms for P odd. So, so on, on, on zero, zero forms, it's D bar. On zero, two forms, it'd be D bar star. You add those two things together. In the Kähler case, that is actually the, that is the Dirac operator for a particular choice of, uh, of, of unitary connection, so the so-called churn connection on, uh, on, the, <laughs> on this anti-canonical line bundle. So if you were, if this was really just the ordinary Dirac operator, the, the Lishnerovitz Weizenbach formula would say that if you took the uh, the Dirac Laplacian applied to a spinner and then took its inner product with the spinner, then you would get a, a an expression which involved half the positive Laplacian of phi squared plus uh, the <coughs> derivative of phi squared plus the scalar curvature over four plus phi squared. That's a very powerful formula in the normal case for a spin manifold. But the problem is that 
when you have a spin C structure, the, the, the connection is coupled with the curvature of the line bundle. And there's a correction term to this Weizenbach formula, which involves the self-dual piece of the curvature of the line bundle in a product, a certain quadratic expression in the spinner. Now, I, I won't go through, I mean, this, this object is built out of basically Clifford multiplication of the spinner with itself. But the key point is that this is some natural expression um, in, in the spinner, and it has the property that um, its absolute value is uh, one over the square root of eight times uh, the norm of the spinner squared. All right, so this mess, the, the fact that, the, that you have to some, somehow account for the, uh, the curvature of that line bundle um, is why very little progress was made uh, with spin C structures. The first place where this was all discussed, it was in uh, Nigel Hitchens' thesis, uh, but he sort of didn't see what to do with it. Um, what Matt and I did was consider the case where you choose the cur curvature so that this uh, curvature form is harmonic. And it turns out that that leads to interesting results. But Witten did something much more profound. He said, consider there are two unknowns. One is the spinner and one is the connection and require them to satisfy a coupled pair of equations. One is that the spinner is killed by the Dirac operator coupled to this connection on L. And the second is that the self, the self dual part of the curvature is that quadratic expression in phi. So the first equation is a linear equation in phi for fixed theta, but the second equation is a nonlinear equation for the, the curvature uh, for, 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 for the, uh, the connection theta described in, if you think of, of the connection theta as a background connection plus uh, plus a one form on the manifold. This is an equation for D of that one form in a quadratic expression in, in, in phi. It, but it turns out that, um, uh, so these are nonlinear. It's mildly nonlinear because there's just a quadratic term, but it, they, do, they, they, they do become elliptic if you introduce uh, the useful gauge fixing condition, choose some background connection and demand that you only change uh, the connection by something that's co-closed. It turns out that up to gauge equivalence, up to automorphisms of the line bundle, you can always arrange for this. So, so geometrically, this has no effect, but it, analytically, it makes the equations elliptic. So the Weizenbach formula has been chosen by that choice of curvature. Uh, it comes down to now adding something that is pleasantly positive. And so you immediately see that, for example, if the scalar curvature was positive, you could not for example, by the maximum principle but, or by integration, you could not have a solution of this that was not identically zero. So you start seeing, well, there should be obstructions to positive scalar curvature. But more comes out of this. There's a, uh, th there's a compactness uh, uh, argument. The moduli space of solutions with, uh, with gauge fixing is actually uh, compact. So there's, there's an a priori C0 bound on, on, uh, on phi. Because at the maximum of, of uh, the norm squared of phi, so with my conventions at the maximum, the Laplacian of phi squared is positive at the maximum. Remember, it's minus the trace of the Hessian. So um, uh, that would then end up telling you that you get um, uh, that, that uh, zero is greater than or equal to the scalar curvature times phi squared plus phi to the fourth. And that ends up giving you uh, at the maximum, uh, 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 phi squared is less than minus the scalar curvature. So that ends up uh, giving you a, a, a uniform C0 bound on phi. And the only time that you don't get that is with phi is identically zero. So, um, so in fact, you find that uh, in particular, um, you, you read off that the, 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 the norm of phi is always less than the square root of the maximum of the negative part of the scalar curvature. And now what you can do is, is uh, apply uh, with Kondrakoff bootstrapping and uh, sublet bootstrapping. It, it, this is, this, you can use uh, P is equal to two as long as, as you don't uh, do it at the first step. Um, so then you, you would find that you get, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of a generalization of the relish there, right? So the inclusion of LPK into LP plus one, uh, LPK plus one is actually compact. And so you get, that these moduli spaces must be compact. So the moduli space is compact, it's finite dimensional. 
Um, and so the, you could ask, well, what is the dimension of this moduli space? Uh, if you don't perturb the equations, there's a problem. It might not be smooth. But if we're, if we're uh, sloppy for the moment, uh, the expected dimension of the gauged fixed system turns out to be uh, C1 squared of L minus 2 chi plus 3 tau over M. So if you're looking at solutions, modulo gauge equivalents, this is the uh, dimension uh, that you expect. In particular, for spin C structures, it came from, from uh, an almost co complex structure. This says the expected dimension is zero. So you would have a discrete uh, moduli space. And so, uh, so what you can, uh, uh, so, so the, the general statement is that uh, uh, for a given spin C structure and a fixed metric, then uh, the preimage of, uh, of a, uh, a regular value of the cyborg witten map um, would be, uh, the preimage would have that dimension. So this is like when you define the uh, mapping degree of, of, of uh, a, a manifold to itself or between two manifolds of the same dimension where you, the expected dimension of the preimage is zero. And then by counting points, in a preimage, you can define the mapping degree. So there's a similar thing that goes on here. Uh, of course, this is in infinite dimensions. Things are non-compact, but it's it works out exactly the same. If it, when the if the spin C structure arises from a, an almost complex structure, the Fredholm index is actually zero, and you can define an invariant by counting the number of solutions modulo gauge equivalents uh, mod two. That's the simplest thing. If you're more careful, you can consistently orient the moduli spaces, and then you can actually get an integer value invariant. The, the, the Z2 value uh, 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 invariant is just basically the generic number of solutions mod two. The key point is that uh, um, that tends to be metric independent. So if B plus is at least two, as the metric varies, the moduli spaces can be shown to be cobordant, co and this number of solutions uh, does not change uh, mod two. And if you count count solutions with the with some uh, correctly chosen signs, in fact, it, the number of solutions doesn't change. Okay, so by counting so solutions uh, uh, mod two, then you get an invariant that just depends on. Uh, the, the, the manifold and the spin C structure coming from an almost complex structure, but you can forget about the almost complex structure at the end, just keep the spin C structure. So uh, the, uh, it, it turns out, uh, I mean, it was first argued by, uh, by Witten that this invariant was non-zero uh, for, uh, if there was a, for a Kähler metric, uh, with uh, on a on a complex surface with B plus uh, bigger than two, then uh, uh, sorry, with a, on a Kähler surface with uh, with B plus greater than or equal to two, basically you can already solve the equations explicitly, account them, and find it's non-zero. The the there's a generalization of that argument uh, due to Taubes, which uh, which actually works just given a symplectic form on the manifold, and so in particular. Under these circumstances, for example, you can find that the, there aren't any metrics of positive scalar curvature. Uh, when B plus is equal to one, the theory is a little more complicated. But for example, it works exactly the same way if, if C1 squared uh, is positive or if C1 squared is, uh, is zero, but the first turn class is not zero in, in real cohomology. Um, <clears throat> so uh, more generally, when B plus is equal to one, there are extra problems that you have to worry about uh, in, in terms of metric dependence of the invariant. One can still do something, but it involves more care. The main uh, structure, the, so one can still get results that involve uh, uh, basically considering more than one spin C structure. So if you're in a situation where there are many spin C structures where the cyber witten invariant is, is well-defined, you can, you can get results even in this B1. B plus equals one case. All right, so there are, are uh, a couple of basic curvature estimates um, that uh, the, the forms I gave them, uh, I'll, I'll describe them. They came out of my work in the mid 90s. Um, so the, uh, if you have a, a Cyberg, a solution of the Cyberg-Witten equations for every metric in a conformal class. So here, 
I've told you about there are, are methods for predicting the existence of, a, of solutions of the cyber Whitten equations, right? That's a, a beautiful story. But the question is, once you have a sol solutions, what do you do with them? So the following uh, estimates hold if you just assume that in a, you're a in a conformal class, where for every metric in the conformal class, there is a solution of the cyber Whitten equations for the fixed spin C structure. And so in this argument, the, the calculations here do, do not depend on where the solution came from. Just assume it's like a black box, assume it exists. If that's true, then you first find that there's a lower bound for the, uh, the integral of the scalar curvature squared. It's bigger than 32 pi squared times C1 of L plus squared. So here there's a, <laughs> you might worry this right-hand side still depends on the metric. The metric determines a self-dual, anti-self-dual decomposition of the, of the cohomology. And rather than just taking the first churn class, which doesn't depend on the metric, project it into the self-dual sector. And uh, then uh, uh, later, um, uh, several years later, I then realized that there was a similar estimate uh, that involved a combination of the scalar curvature and the, the point-wise norm of the uh, self-dual vial curvature. And the interesting point here is that the coefficient is considerably larger. So uh, here, we're, uh, remember the first churn class is an element of the second cohomology, you could say with, with integer coefficients, but let's just look at it in real cohomology. And then it has a self-dual and anti-self-dual piece. And so uh, for a given metric, uh, you, you, you project C1 into the, the, uh, into the, the uh, uh, self-dual harmonic forms. And now you'll have, you, you have extra, uh, extra worry as the, as the metric varies, uh, the subspace H plus varies and you have to keep, you have to prove theorems that ultimately at the end, manage to read off something that's metric independent. All right, so <clears throat> I'll show you how to do that later, but I'll quickly show you where these estimates come from. Uh, the, they both come out of this basic Weizenbach formula. Uh, if you take the basic Weizenbach formula and then you uh, and then you integrate it, uh, you you immediately see that the integral of the scalar curvature times phi squared plus phi to the fourth is non-positive. And now um, uh, move one term over to the other side of the equation, apply Cauchy-Schwarz, and you get some relationship between the scalar uh, integral of the scalar curvature squared and the integral of phi to the fourth. Right, so integral of, of uh, scalar curvature squared is actually bigger than the <laughs> integral of the size of the spinner to the fourth power. But on the other hand, the equations, there was this other equation that said the curvature, self-dual part of the curvature was actually dictated by the spinner. And that ends up saying that you prove that this, the, the, if you have a solution of the cyber Whitten equation, the integral of scalar curvature squared is bigger than eight times the self-dual part of the curvature squared. And then that's greater than or equal to its harmonic part. So uh, interestingly, when does the, uh, the equality occur? Well, you would have to have that uh, the spinner is parallel with respect to this connection. And you'd also have the scalar curvature uh, would have, so if we assume that C1, uh, if we're assuming that phi is not identically zero, that would say that uh, the scalar curvature would be negative. And uh, then, um, so you would end up concluding that your, your uh, so sigma of phi, this quadratic expression would also be parallel. You would end up concluding that your metric has special holonomy because there's a parallel two form. It's actually a Kähler metric. And you would find that the scalar curvature is constant and, neg and, uh, and would have to be negative. So the metric is constant scalar curvature Kähler. And you also re read off uh, that the connection theta is actually the, the churn connection on the anti-canonical line bundle. So in this case, if you had a constant scalar curvature Kähler metric with negative scalar curvature, you follow this argument through, you can say, oh, I can actually write down the only solution of the cyborg Whitten equations up to gauge equivalence. And so you would find, this is a di rather direct way in that case, if you know there's a constant scalar curvature Kähler metric on your manifold, of negative scalar curvature, you could explicitly just say, well, here's for that metric, there's only the following solution. Therefore, the invariant is one. Um, so in fact, there are lots of, of, of uh, it was later shown by, uh, for example, uh, Claudio Arezzo and uh, 
from Pacquiao that uh, there that there are lots of uh, constant scalar curvature. Uh, uh, there are lots of of, uh, of complex uh, surfaces with constant scalar curvature. This is one way of kind of it's it's using an elephant gun to kill a mouse. That's one way of seeing that the cyborg Whitman variant is uh, is actually one for a lot of things. There's a more robust version that you, it's much easier to just perturb the equations in the right way. You can show that whenever you have a Kähler metric where the integral of the scalar curvature is negative, that uh, this invariant would be actually uh, one. All right, the second estimate um, is more subtle, and that's why it took me longer to find it. Um, so uh, it involves looking at this expression, uh, the scalar curvature minus square root of six times W, the pointwise norm of W plus. That's a so-called uh, generalized scalar curvature. This is a trick I learned from Matt Gersty. Um, the point is that re such expressions rescale exactly like the standard scalar curvature. If you change the, the metric by multiplying the metric by u squared, the rescaling law is exactly the same as for the standard scalar curvature. And uh, so, in fact, the first proof of that inequality, I made the I solved the Yamabe problem for this uh, this. Uh, generalized scalar curvature to arrange it to be constant in order to make the proof simpler. Uh, later on, I found a, a more elementary proof. And uh, that's what I'll, what I'll uh, actually de describe. So um, the point is that this the, the cyborg witten equations are not conformally invariant. It's important that they're not. Even though the Dirac operator has a certain conformal invariance, the cyborg witten equations are not conformally invariant. What happens is that if you had a, a solution uh, with respect to a rescale metric f to the minus two times g. Um, with respect to the background metric g, the, the solution that you solve for that conformally rescaled metric looks like the cyborg witten equations, but with an f inserted here. If you're worried about in the side, so you'd say, well, is that choice of, of, of the curvature mag magical? Why don't, why, why don't I just multiply that by some function? As long as the function's positive, that's just conformally rescaling the metric. And so you get a new Weizenbach formula where this uh, positive function appears. So now uh, the trick is uh, you can multiply this by two and integrate. And uh, then you can reinterpret this in terms of, well, there was this two form that was lurking sigma of phi. So if you introduce the two form sigma of phi times the square root of eight, then uh, you find that that satisfies a Weizenbach formula um, of, of the following shape. It's a, so it's zero is greater than the covariant derivative squared plus the scalar curvature times uh, the, the two form squared. And then you have this F times psi cubed. So this F in principle could be any function, right? Any positive function. But if you just trace through, you first, you use the fact that there's a, the, the, the Weizenbach formula for the Hodge Laplacian ends up saying that the covariant derivative squared of, uh, of any two of self dual two form has uh, integral bigger than uh, uh, that two form times some uh, mul mul multiplied by scalar curvature over three times uh, uh, two square roots of uh, uh, two thirds times uh, the self dual vial curvature. And now, uh, so what you can then do is barter away this covariant derivative term to get something that just involves curvature. And uh, now you want to play the same kind of game bef as before. Um, you want to move one term uh, to the other side, but now it's not Cauchy-Schwartz, it's the Holder inequality. And um, so what you end up con concluding is that uh, uh, <coughs> the integral of, of f to the fourth to the power one third times uh, the integral of uh, scalar, this odd scalar curvature, this uh, perturbed scalar curvature cubed times f to the minus two times uh, integral of that to the two thirds is bigger than this uh, uh, in integral of f squared times psi squared. Now, it, the point is that f, this, this is, the, is actually the size of the self-dual part of the curvature. So you find that this is greater than 72 pi squared times c1 plus squared. So this looks like a mess because it still involves the f on the left-hand side. So, but you can choose f to be any positive function. Take a sequence of positive functions coming down from above to the square root of, of uh, absolute value of s minus square root of w plus. And now, uh, so this would have been bigger than the integral of that, right? And now on the other hand, this 
basically cancels off of power. So you'd find that in the limit, you get a, a lower bound for the uh, L2 norm squared of uh, this uh, uh, generalized scalar curvature. Now, um, in order to get anything out of this, it's important that, to know that in the theory of complex surfaces, there's a process called uh, blowing up. You can uh, take a complex surface and replace a point with a CP1 to get a new com smooth complex surface. Uh, what you've done, uh, it, your new CP1, uh, your new, the introduced CP1 has normal bundle that looks like the so-called tautological line bundle, the churn class minus one line bundle over CP1. And the, in terms of what you've done to the topology is that you've smoothly taken a connected sum with CP2 bar. So the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the churn class minus one line bundle sits in CP1 times C2. And that, therefore, if you collapse the zero section of the O minus one line bundle uh, uh, to a point, you get C2. And you can use that as a local model to glue in a copy of uh, the churn class minus one line bundle over CP1. And uh, on the other hand, um, um, it, it turns out that uh, the one point compactification of that line bundle is just CP2 bar. This, the effect of this is taking a connected sum with CP2 bar smoothly. So a, smooth, a, a complex surface is said to be minimal if it's not the blow up of another complex surface. And uh, it's an observation uh, used by Kadira, but really going back to Enriquez that uh, any complex surface can be obtained from a minimal uh, surface. So given a complex surface, you could write it as a minimal surface blown up at a certain number of points. And then one says that this X is a minimal model of the, of the complex surface. So um, a, a very special class of complex surfaces, I mentioned them before, the surfaces of general type. For example, if there was a negative uh, Taylor-Einstein metric, that would be of general type, but more generally, a complex surface is of general type if and only if its minimal model has C1 squared positive and if, uh, if, there's a, if there's a Kähler form on that minimal model where C1 uh, dot the uh, uh, intersection pairing with the, uh, with the Kähler form is negative. And in, in this setting, uh, there's a unique minimal model. All right, so uh, suppose you take a minimal surface of general type so it's gotten from a minimal, minimal surface of general type. Now you blow it up to, to a certain number of times, k times, to get a typical surface of, of, minim, of general type. So general type surface is something that's gotten by, from a minimal uh, surface of general type by blowing up a certain number of points. OK, so uh, this is for a surface of general type. Uh, it turns out that the Yamabe invariant of the complex surface is the same as for its minimal model. So, this is really the punchline that, uh, that you're, you'd be asking about, well, what, for what kind of manifolds can we calculate the Yamabe invariant? Well, blowing up uh, a surface of general type does not change the Yamabe invariant. It's the same as for the minimal model. And for the minimal model, you get the same kind of formula for the, uh, for the Yamabe invariant that we saw previously in the Kähler-Einstein case. The reason that the, you get the same formula is it's not quite true that the, any, any minimal surface of general type has a Kähler-Einstein metric, but it, there's something else called the pluricanonical model, which is an, or, it's an, an orbifold generalization, which does admit an orbifold Kähler-Einstein metric. The same argument um, really gives rise to, to this calculation of the Yamabe invariant for the minimal model. All right, so uh, the key in, one key ingredient is that first curvature uh, estimate. Uh, which, uh, let me now show you, on the other hand, how you can instead use the second curvature estimate. So in the Gauss-Binet formula um, for 2 chi plus 3 tau, uh, the key term, uh, if you ignore the trace tree Ricci curvature term, what you would see is the scalar curvature squared over 24 plus 2 times uh, the self-dual vial curvature uh, squared, and it's just uh, a little uh, piece of algebra that, well, you could write that uh, in terms of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the square of this perturbed scalar curvature and then some other perturbation of the scalar curvature. This is just uh, in empty algebra. But uh, in particular, that says that uh, there's a lower bound for this Gauss-Binet, uh, this term that enters in a Gauss-Binet integrand, it's bigger than 1 27th of that, uh, uh, that perturbed scalar curvature squared. 
And so uh, now we have a lower bound for this integral. So um, the, the argument, the way the argument works is that when you've blown up, it's not that there's just one uh, uh, spin C structure for which the cybered witten invariant is non-zero. There are self-diffeomorphisms of a blown up surface where you can leave the, the, the first churn class of the minimal model unchanged, but reverse the sign of the generator for the blow up. And so it turns out that uh, the estimates you get, because we insisted on using not C1 squared, but C1 plus squared, by playing the different spin C structures off against each other, everything is estimated in terms of C1 squared of the minimal model. So you get, uh, the, this, you get this estimate for the integral of scalar curvature squared over uh, uh, twice W plus squared. However, in the Einstein case, if your metric is Einstein, this is just twice the Euler characteristic plus three times the signature. And on the other hand, uh, this would be uh, C1 squared of X. It's twice the Euler characteristic plus three times the signature of X. But when you blow up, that number goes down. So even though, so for X itself, this is a kind of uninteresting inequality. When it's a non-minimal surface, this turns out to be quite, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, non-trivial. By the way, um, uh, here you might wonder why you don't have to, uh, wh why the, 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 bound, the fact the boundary case is, uh, is, is uh, impossible uh, involves the, the, the fact that uh, this is the one place where you use the, the Yamabe uh, property for this perturbed scalar curvature. You could arrange for it to be constant. All right, so uh, it, it ends up you would have a contradiction if equality held, so you get a strict inequality here. And so uh, you find that if you, so the conclusion is a topological one that uh, if there's an Einstein metric on M and it's blown up from X, then uh, twice the order characteristic plus three times the signature of M is bigger than two thirds of twice the Euler characteristic plus three times the signature of X. So, uh, but it, you know, C, C1 squared of M is actually, uh, when you blow up, you reduce C1 squared by one. And so you'd find that um, if this blown up surface has an Einstein metric, the number of blow ups has to be less than one third of C1 squared of X. So if you just use something like the Hitchin-Thorpe inequality, you'd find that if there's an Einstein metric, then K would be less than C1 squared X. Here you pick up this factor of three. Okay. So, um, so the, the, the final theorem is that if you have a, a surface of a minimal surface of general type and, uh, and, uh, and it admits a, and it's gotten from its minimal model by blowing up uh, K points, then it, there, there is no Einstein metric on it if the number of blowups is bigger than, uh, uh, this should be C1 squared of X to, uh, over three, sorry. So this uh, being very minimal is, a non, uh, is an obstruction. So for example, um, you get, uh, you can contrast this. Some uh, things have uh, Kähler-Einstein metrics by the obama yau theorem. One example is if you take the double branch cover of CP2 ramified over a smooth octic. So you have a, you take a, a smooth curve of degree eight in CP2. There's a way of getting another complex surface which maps two to one. Uh, uh, to this, uh, this uh, to CP2, where the preimage of a point is of uh, consists of two points, unless you're on this optic. And uh, Obama Yao would imp imply that uh, this is a surface which admits an Einstein metric. But there's a similar thing. You could take a sextic curve in CP2 and take uh, a ramified uh, uh, cyclic uh, triple cover ramified at that sextic. Um, and now we could consider the manifold where we've blown that, um, that up at one point. Uh, this X has C1 squared equal to three. Um, you find that, and this should be if uh, C1 squared X over three. So we've blown up, we're in the range where, where we have an obstruction. So, um, so there, the theorem is that this manifold admit, does not admit an Einstein metric, right? But, punchline is that we, I've just shown you two different four manifolds that arise as complex surfaces. One admits an Einstein metric, the other does not. 
but uh, one is, uh, uh, they're both simply connected. They're both non-spin. They have the same Euler characteristic. They have the same signature. Therefore, Friedman Donaldson says these are homeomorphic. One of them admits an Einstein metric, the other does not. So in other words, it's saying the existence of Einstein metrics depends on the smooth structure. It's not topologically determined. All right, so um, that's a good place to, to stop this first lecture. I just realized well, I went over time, but my apologies. Thank you. Are there questions? Uh, about your second curvature estimate, uh, you expect it could be sharp? Well, the, it, it is sharp in the sense that uh, if, if, you're, if you take um, a constant scalar curvature Kähler metric and, and you're looking at the original estimate in terms of C1 plus squared, mm -hmm. um, then yes, that, that is sharp in that case. So both of, these, uh, both of these inequalities are saturated for constant scalar curvature Kähler metrics okay. of negative scalar curvature. Um, so that... You know, that uh, metric it, it itself, um, so that inequality it itself is, is sharp, but by the time you've, you've gotten in, uh, there are other steps in these applications to say the theory of Einstein metrics. And um, it, it, you certainly expect uh, that you've thrown something away. So I think it's quite possible that there might be some more clever way of carrying out uh, the intermediate steps where you might be able to improve it so if, so if you're trying to those it, kind of manifolds, maybe you can get a better. Yes. So instance. so specifically, uh, the the sort of um, the the sort of of uh, estimate you're looking for is is for this term that occurs in a Gauss-Binet integram. You're not so the original the sharp estimate is for this peculiar uh, uh, generalized scalar curvature, but then you. But then in order to make that into something useful, you, you throw something away. And um, so a very good question is, for example, if, you, if you're, for these other intermediate steps, if you assume something like the, you know, you're looking at a metric with harmonic self-dual vial curvature or some hypothesis, maybe there's a little bit of uh, extra headroom you can, you can find. Um, I, I've, I've, I've tried. I haven't succeeded, but that doesn't mean that no one will. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I have a kind of naive uh, question. Um, in case the Yamabe invariant uh, is not attained, uh, say in dimension four, right? is there any general understanding or <coughs> expectation about uh, maximizing sequences? Yeah, so, um, so th this is a, a very good and natural question. Um, so th there are, uh, so one, one example would be in these uh, arguments, I've, I've just made the assertion that, so in suppose, for simplicity, suppose you, you start with a complex surface that has a negative Kähler-Einstein metric, right? And there the Yamabe invariant is a, a, attained. Now you could blow up some points on it. That does not change the Yamabe invariant, but the theorem is that on the blow up, you can never, uh, you can never saturate. You can never achieve the the uh, this. So th that's a slightly different uh, 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 aspect of these arguments. I didn't go through it, but when you have a non-minimal sur uh, surface of general type, the Yamabe invariant is the same as from the middle model, but it's never achieved. And so what happens is that um, uh, the the cyborg witten theory gives you. Um, uh, gives you uh, an upper bound for the Yamabe invariant, and now you have to produce a sequence of metrics where, uh, say, the integral of, of, of the of scalar curvature squared is going to the target. And the way you build those is by uh, putting in standard plugs. So in those, in those particular cases, you would find, I mean, you might hope that that's the typical thing, but I, I, I believe that what usually happens is far worse. So in those, for, in those particular constructions of calculating the Yamabe invariant, the sequences are, very, are, are relatively simple, right? You have 
basically you take a Kähler Einstein metric, you modify it uh, in this blown up region by using a standard metric called the Burns metric on the, on the blow up of C2 at the origin, which is an asymptotically Euclidean scalar flat Kähler metric. Um, in the general, uh, but I, what, what has to happen in the, gen, you know, more generally is that you can have collapse type phenomena. This is a non-collapsing situation. Uh, a more typical thing would be um, uh, among complex surfaces, uh, there, there are a lot of them that are so-called elliptic surfaces that um, they fiber over some curve with typical, uh, typical fiber a two torus. Right. It's a holomorphic map from the, 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 the complex surface to a, sur a curve, uh, uh, this is say to a Riemann surface where the typical fiber, the general fiber is, is T2. There's some singular fibers. In those cases, the Mobbian invariant turns out to always be zero. And the reason is that you have collapsing sequences. It's generalizing the kind of naive thing. If you take, if you take a Riemann surface times a two torus, give the two torus a flat metric, now shrink the size of that. That doesn't, the curvature staying bounded, the volume is going to zero. The integral of scalar curvature squared must go to zero. So uh, these kinds of collapsing, this collapsing phenomenon is, uh, is I think the, the more typical thing. And you expect, um, so I, th I think this is a, a wonderful thing for tr someone to try to prove uh, a, a good general theorem on, on the behavior of sequences, but you expect that there must be, you know, some, in general, there, there are going to be collapsed regions. There'll be a, you might have a thick, thin decomposition, some co collapsed regions, and maybe there's a thick part where the, the, the convergence of the metric is better. Um, and this, is a, this is a pipe dream. I don't know what can really be done, but, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a natural question. Uh, when you say it's a, a naive question, yes, the naive questions are often the best ones. What is, <laughs> what, it can, is there anything one can prove? It's, it's plausible that, that the, the, the problem might be tractable, but it'll be complicated. You can expect a lot of bends on the road and uh, hard work to be done. Yeah, good question. Thanks. I have a small question too, sorry. So um, you told us that uh, the informal in the conformal class of the einstein hilbert function has always attained. And, but its problem is to have to go to the supremum. Yes. Is there a way to like uh, study like saddle point types? And if if it's possible, like in the moduli space, um, to do some kind of non-stability or stability um, computations? Yes. So um, <clears throat> there has been a little bit of work in, on these kinds of, of, of uh, questions. I believe that uh, uh, Jeff Biaklovsky and I think Matt Gursky and some other people have, have asked questions about this. Um, so. Um, the, 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 so certainly when, when the, the, the picture I, I drew of, uh, of, of, say, of imagining that you could uh, maybe find, if you're at an, if, if you were at an Einstein metric, the natural question is, well, is this even locally like one of these Yamabe minimaxes? Uh, and that would end up, uh, unfortunately, that some people have used the term stability. It's used in, in the best book on Einstein manifolds. Uh, this is unrelated to things like case stability for Einstein, a Kähler Einstein metric. But there, there is this question about if you're at a, if, if you're at an Einstein metric, you, and now you ref, you uh, get rid of uh, conformal rescaling by uh, just focusing the re, uh, restricting the Hessian of the Einstein-Hilbert functional to the transverse traceless uh, uh, direction. Uh, is, is, are you at a local maximum or not. And it, what happens in general is there can be some a finite number of positive directions that can be infinitely many ne negative directions. Um, it, the, 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 there are, are some uh, results on, on this, you know, under, under certain, certain circumstances, there aren't any positive directions, but it's, the, the theory is not very satisfac is that satisfying at this point. And one hopes that it could be better understood. Thank you. Are there further questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, maybe you will tell this in the next lectures, but uh, I just want to ask. I mean, can you tell us something about the uh, metrics that achieves the, the Yamabe invariant? I mean, what is the expectation? Of, I mean, 
Um, yeah. So at this point, um, known. There, there is no um, there is no general uh, theory of um, in, in particular in the positive case. Um, so the, the 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 naive picture is uh, well. Suppose you had a metric that did achieve this Yamabe minimax. Is it Einstein? But I mean that you would naively well. Of course, it must be Einstein. Actually, there is a technical problem, and it's one that you know, some people have spent a lot of time beating their head against the wall trying to overcome. It's still uh, there are a few theorems uh, about this, and it has to do. It, it, oddly enough, it has to do. Uh, with solutions not of the Einstein equations, but of the static Einstein equations. It's the, it's, so if, it, it's the equation that would come up if you had uh, a warp product Einstein metric of, of your manifold times R. Um, it's, um, uh, it, this problem is, is hard and not well understood. Uh, I think that it, but I, I, I suspect that there are counterexamples. Um, a very good question in particular um, is, if you if you take uh, a manifold like S two times S two, um, I already indicated that there is no. Uh, you know, you can definitely show that that there's no Einstein metric that achieves the Yamabe invariant for that manifold. We don't actually know what the Yamabe invariant in that manifold is, but we have enough information on it that says that to tell us that the Einstein there's no Einstein metric that achieves it. So. On the other hand, you could certainly, you know, draw. You, you think about this picture. It's possible that on S two times S two that there is a metric that achieves the, the minimax, but isn't Einstein. Uh, my own belief is that actually happens, but um, um, it, so that there might be a counterexample to this. Long, I mean, the reason that people have been beating their head against the problem without making any progress is well, maybe what they're trying to prove is not true. <laughs> um, but it's 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 uh, it's a frustrating problem, and uh, the 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 maybe the main moral to come away from this is that while this uh, this this variational picture is a, a wonderful uh, thing to, for example, motivate the definition of the Yamabe invariant, you do know it doesn't work most of the time, <laughs> and um, you maybe one shouldn't take that that uh, that picture too literally. As, a, as an approach of, of how to find Einstein metrics. Certainly, anyway, you can prove in higher dimensions, there are many, many cases where you can, where you can produce an Einstein metric, which definitely is not the Yamabe minimax. So on four manifolds, it's not, the situation is much less clear. Thank you very much. Are there further questions? If not, before we thank the speaker of the morning again, so the information there's organized lunch uh, outside and uh, we resume tomorrow at nine. Thank you very much.